2018 Planning Commission meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody for coming down. Thank you for taking part in the city's business. And our first item of agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Commissioners, have you all looked at the agenda? Any corrections, additions, or is there a motion to adopt? All right, there's a motion to adopt and a second. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it, and today's agenda is adopted, and that takes us to item C, which is the approval of the September 13th, 2018 minutes. Those were mailed out prior to the meeting to you, commissioners. Any additions, edits? Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve, is there a second? Second, seeing no other discussion, all in favor of the minutes say aye. aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it, and the minutes have been adopted. So now we are on to the recognition of the council members, and I just, we go by um, first come uh, into the meeting, so um, I saw Councilman Kendall, do you wanna go first, or do you wanna go on your item? On the item, okay, no problem. And then I saw Councilor Berkeley Allen next. You wanna go on the item or you can come up and talk now. Welcome, appreciate you coming down. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, uh, Ber Berkeley Allen, I'm the council member for District 18 and I would like to speak about item 3A, which is 2018 SP 049001, um, and which is the uh, SP for the Murphy Road mixed use project. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with y'all about this. Uh, it actually does not sit in my district. It is in a funny little corner that is bounded by three different districts and Council Member Kendall and, and Murphy will address the, uh, the issues that um, their, uh, their constituents are concerned about. Uh, this is um, on an interesting little island that is bound by West End I-440 and the biggest, widest part of Murphy Road. Uh, they are proposing a fairly large mixed use um, office and hotel and retail project that uh, in uh, anything touching a neighborhood I think would uh, would, would have um, elicited some pretty strong concern on my part. But because it is on this uh, funny little island, which you'll see when, you, when the pictures come up, I have, um, have entertained the, the option that has been presented by the developers and um, it, looking through the lens of Nashville Next, it says put our density on the corridor. Um, it does sit back from the corridor by a, a gas station and some other fairly commercial uses. So I think if these, um, if these uh, uses are coming to town, they might as well sit right next to an interstate where they can get right on the interstate and not be driving through my through my streets. I do have some constituents that you'll hear from um, who are concerned about the traffic that it, that it will produce, and I, I think that's an important concern. Um, they live up on the area of Orleans and Ackland, which is very small, curvy streets that um, already have more traffic on it than it, than it bears well. Um, we would love to have more traffic calming on those areas, and the owners have agreed to meet with us next week, um, next Wednesday, to talk about the traffic study that's been done. Um, and the numbers that, that those have generated and the possibility that those might um, increase traffic cut through um, through our area and traffic calming um, initiatives that, that could be implemented there. They have agreed to, um, to set aside some funding to help make sure that that happens. We will have to work with Public Works. They'll be with this meeting as well. So um, given the fact that they are willing to continue to talk about that, um, I, I think that that is the major issue that this, um, this fairly large project will will produce that's a, of concern to my neighbors. Um, I appreciate the fact that they're willing to continue to talk and, and uh, intend to have a very productive meeting. Um, we will work to make sure that whatever condition that is um, gonna be making will be included in the final version of the bill if it's not included in your conditions here. There are two very small things that um, I would also like to be perhaps amended in the conditions if that's possible. This is slightly technical, but I live close to there and I run over there and I know about these sidewalks and how important the pedestrian 
industry and infrastructure is as well. Um, one is, is that the um, recommendation was to remove the concrete median at I-440 on the westbound ramp so that the traffic could come directly out of Murphy Court onto I-440. And I think enabling them to do that effectively is part of what makes this not nearly as threatening from a traffic standpoint. So I, I applaud that change. However, for a pedestrian walking across the sidewalk, that creates a really wide crossing. Um, I understand that there's supposed to be a, a pedestrian signal to get you across there, but if you look at the map, it's it's um, it's almost as wide as, as West End. So you might add a condition of putting some kind of pedestrian refuge in there somewhere. I would just request that somebody look at that. And then secondly, um, there's a reference to the timing of the West End and bowling light, which is actually on the other side of I-440 down West End, um, that they would rework the timing on that to make sure that it works well with this light. I would ask that the traffic at Elmington Avenue also be considered because that's, um, Brian, as you know, you probably drive through that a lot. Um, that's a, a street that currently does not have a light exiting onto West End. It is very difficult to get out in the mornings there. It's possible for the light at Bowling and West End to create a gap to make that possible, and it's also possible for that gap to be totally wiped out if nobody's paying attention. So again, kind of a technical thing, but if, if those considerations can be taken into account while they're looking at the traffic, I would appreciate it. So to sum up, um, this project is not in my district. I will defer to... Uh, uh, Councilmember Kendall on his recommendations, um, but it does affect my district, and I would um, appreciate that the traffic concerns be dealt with. I appreciate that the, the owner is willing to meet with us, and I expect that we'll have a productive meeting and come up with whatever conditions we can to hopefully address the concerns of my constituents who, who, um, who deserve not to have additional cut-through traffic added to their streets. So thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Council. I appreciate your thoughts, and we, we have those noted for sure. Next, I saw Councilman Murphy. You want to go now? Come on up. Welcome. <laughs> no, I don't have any money. Um, <laughs> Councilwoman Kathleen Murphy. Um, and so I'm going to just piggyback right on the, the issue and the item that, that Council Lady Berkeley Allen was just speaking about. I don't have my typical policy notes and things for you all today because um, I'm going to just ask for a plain deferral. Um, I know that this is a big project. Um, we have only been able to have one real community meeting on this issue. Um, we had the, the developer was was great at setting up kind of a smaller community meeting where people could go to stations and they had the 3D virtual reality stuff. Um, the plan has changed significantly there for the for the better since that meeting, but I think it was last week or the week before I was able to get a meeting together very last minute um, and it was only an hour long because I had another meeting afterwards for another planning issue that I'll get to in a minute. Um, and so a lot of my constituents, as you'll see in the emails um, and letters that you've received, they don't know all the updates. Um, and I think that you'll hear from the developer, as I just heard from the developer's representative walking here in here tonight, that there's still some things that they're willing to change. And so I don't think we're there yet. Um, I'm going to still s stick hard to that this building is still too tall. It came in, started at 300 feet, somewhere around there. They've come down to 207, I believe. That's still very, very tall for my neighborhood of Richland West End, which is a historic neighborhood, um, to still kind of grapple and deal with. So we're still working through that. Um, I think there needs to be some more looking at the green space around here. The Richland Creek Greenway, uh, I'm sorry, not Richland. Creek Greenway. The new I-440 Greenway Phase 1 is about to open here. I feel very strongly that if you were to recommend this for approval tonight, um, I, which I really hope you'll defer, but I think it has to include some sort of language that says that the hotel or this development needs to contribute to the development and upkeep of that 440 Greenway Phase 1 because I know that every hotel I've gone to in the past two years offers you a running map or um, some sort of walking map around the area, and the 440 Greenway will be significantly impacted by this development as an amenity of that hotel. And so I think it's vital that we make that a condition and a mandatory thing if y'all move forward with it tonight. But I hope that you'll defer it. Um, I think there's some more things to work out. Um, this is still a really tall building that a lot of my neighbors are still unsure about that height. and I'll 
remind you, although I have confirmed with your staff that it is just mere feet outside of the scenic highway, um, the scenic highway, if you're not familiar with it, on West End controls the height within a thousand feet. And this is literally feet outside of that. And I think that should be considered when we're looking at how does that stair step in other directions and how does the scenic highway apply to the parcels next to this one that we know will develop in the near future. Um, I think the policy here probably did not take into consideration that height um, limitation by the scenic highway that was put in place in the 70s by, I mean, I'm mean, so sick of hearing about my father who's in the back of the room who passed in the 70s with Senator Henry and they passed that because they didn't want tall buildings. These neighborhoods didn't want to be able to see that from their neighborhood. So I think it's important that that height it comes closer to the average of the other buildings in that surrounding area, which your staff can tell me tell you better than I can, I think is around 150. So that's something that they need to work on. So I ask that you all defer that. Um, and if not, please put some more conditions on it. But I think we can defer it and hopefully get to a better place. Um, I also wanted to touch briefly on the um, Charlotte Pike study, the corridor study that your staff has done a wonderful job on. We are really close on that. Um, I know we're going to defer at one meeting because I think we're almost there, but there's a few more things that we need to work out. And so I appreciate y'all looking at that and all the work that your staff has done on it. It's been huge. And then I asked for a recommend a recommendation of approval on item 14 and item 15. So that's gonna be the salt property that Metro owns and then a state owned property. Those two are really what spurred the need for the Charlotte corridor. And so I think that those SPs, those regulatory SPs are going to make those the sell of those properties much better for the state, much better for the neighborhoods. Um, when it gets to council, I do have an amendment already drafted for those SPs. It's gonna take out a few more uses, um, alternative financial districts, um, gas station, and I think it's going to also make traffic studies mandatory rather than recommended. So I ask for your approval on those, and I'll tweak them and make them a little better when it gets to me at council. So thank you all so much, and have a good night. Thank you, Council Lady. I really appreciate it. Councilman? I guess I need to go on such a week. Yeah, come on up, Councilman. No problem. Well, I Welcome. Wanna, I want to thank uh, Council Lady Allen and uh, Council Lady Murphy for giving you all the details, uh, it saves me a little, a few words. But I think they're, they're exactly right where this is located. It's like in a little corner of all of our districts, but it actually physically sits in the 21st district. Um, I know there have been a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, community meetings. Uh, as I understand it, a lot of work with the developer, with the planning staff, and I want to let you know, appreciate that very much. Uh, last meeting I went to, it was a pretty large meeting on West, at West End Middle, and there were, it was good attendance. Uh, I did find out at that meeting that about 90% of those there were not residents in the district that I represent, but basically in the Richland, Richland area. Um, I agree with uh, Council Lady Allen that there's some things I, I agree that should be done, and I, I understand the developers are going to continue to work with the community to do those things, especially as it relates to parking and those kinds of issues, uh, uh, the greenway and, and all those issues. And but but I think the from what I was able to discover at that meeting, the height of this project seemed to be the the, the big sticking point. Uh, when, when, when I first learned of the project, and it was first brought to me, I believe, the, as, as Council Lady Murphy said, it was, uh, I think it's been cut down about a third from uh, 300 feet to about 200 feet approximately. Uh, I don't know that it makes any sense to go any further down. I mean, that's, that's a, a professional decision, I think, that has to be made by, by you guys as well as the, the developer. It sits on the interstate, I mean, you know, right there on the corner. I don't, I don't see that it causes that problem. I've heard comments about, well, I can see it from my home. You know, from some people who actually said, we don't really want to be able to see that tall a building. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I live in a neighborhood. I, I don't have tall buildings, so I can't, can't, can't really address that. I know we have a lot of tall buildings downtown. 
But I think at this point, it's, it's at a point where a lot of the things uh, that they're talking about, I want them to continue to work with the community, and I certainly agree with uh, Council Lady Allen, and I will try to help participate and facilitate uh, that th those meetings, that, uh, even in her district. Uh, like I said, I have not gotten very few complaints from constituents who live in the 21st district. Almost none, and and that may be because they are not sitting right there to look at the building. But I think the height issue is one that we can continue to talk about. But I don't think I think at this point I'm supporting moving it on to council, and then at that point we can continue to to discuss it because we got three readings, as you well know, and and it's not going to be something we would. Uh, just say, hey, we're just going to push it through and not continue to work with the community. So I'm, I'm supporting uh, not deferring it tonight and, uh, and moving on with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. Any other council members in the audience? I want to make sure we don't miss anybody. I don't, I don't see any more. All right, we're on item E, which is items for deferral withdrawal. Lisa? We have the following items for deferral or withdrawal. Item number one, 2018 SP 001001 on page five of your agenda, the Sloan and Westlawn SP. It's a request to rezone from R6 to SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Item number five on page six of your agenda, 2005 UD 005006, the Bedford Hotel. It's a request for a final site plan in the Bedford Avenue Avenue UDO. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Item number seven on page six of your agenda, the West Nashville Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the West Nashville Community Plan for various properties along Charlotte Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Item number eight, 2018 CP 012002 on page six of your agenda, the Southeast Community Plan Amendment. It's a request to amend the Southeast Community Plan for properties along Flora Maxwell, Goins Road, and Old Goins Road. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 25th Planning Commission meeting. Item number 12 on page seven of your agenda, 2018 SP 058001, 1265 McGavick Pike SP. It's a request to rezone from RS 7.5 to SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the November 8th Planning Commission meeting. And item number 13, 2018 SP 062001 on page seven of your agenda, the 222 to 228 Donaldson Pike SP. It's a request to rezone from R10 to SP. Staff recommendation is to defer to the October 11th Planning Commission meeting. Thank you, Lisa. Commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral, and I'll go through those particular items, make sure I get this correct, Lisa. Items number one, five, seven, eight, 12, and 13. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and I have to recuse myself from item five. Uh, any, any other discussion? Is there a motion to adopt? it has been a motion to adopt and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the deferred and withdrawn items say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred or withdrawn. <clears throat> We're on item F, which is the consent agenda, Lisa. As information for our audience, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of entry of the Planning Commission's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should con contact independent legal counsel. As a notice to the public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearings will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. The following items are on the consent agenda. 
Item number 4, 2018-S-128-001, on page 6 of your agenda, 1308 Lytton Avenue. It's a request for final plat approval to create two lots on property located on Lytton Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number six on page six of your agenda, 2018-Z-073-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from RS-5 and IR to MULA and RM-20A zoning for properties located on 26th Avenue North, Clifton Avenue at the northwest corner of 26th and Clifton. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 10, 2018-Z-006-TX-001 on page 7 of your agenda. It's a request to amend section 1724060 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws pertaining to screening requirements for dumpsters and other trash receptacles. Staff recommendation is to approve with a condition. Item number 14 on page 7 of your agenda, 2018 SP 065001, the 4110 Charlotte SP. It's a request to rezone from IR to SP for property located on Charlotte Avenue to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 15 on page 8 of your agenda. 2018 SP 066001, the 3800 Charlotte SP. It's a request to rezone from IR and CS to SP for zone, zoning for property located on Charlotte Avenue to permit a mixed use development. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 16 on page 8 of your agenda. The Cowboy Jack Studio Development Plan 2014 NL 003003. It's a request for approval of a neighborhood landmark development plan for property located on Belmont Boulevard to permit an addition. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 17 on page 8 of your agenda. A re uh, 2018 S149001, a request for final plat approval to create three lots for property located on 25th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 18 on page 8 of your agenda, 2018 S162001, a request for final plat approval to create three lots on property located on Elm Hill Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 19, 89P022006, the Melrose Shopping Center PUD revision and final. It's a request to revise a portion of a preliminary plan and for final site plan approval for property within a planned unit development on 8th Avenue South. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. Item number 20 on page 9 of your agenda, 2018-Z-088-PR-001, a request to rezone from AR2A to R15 for property located on Hamilton Church Road. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 22 on page 9, 2018-Z-094-PR-001, a request to rezone from SP to RM15 for property located on 9th Avenue North. Staff recommendation is to approve. Under other business, item 23, a contract renewal for Jason Swagger, and a number 27 to accept the director's report and approve administrative items. Thank you, Lisa. So let's go over this, commissioners, make sure we get the right items for the consent agenda because a few items have been pulled off. So make sure I have the correct items. But it's item number 4, 6, 10. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, and 27. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for the consent agenda. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? It's been a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items have been passed. So we are now on to item two, and this was pulled from the consent agenda. And so I want to make a note to the commissioners that this item has already been through a public hearing. It's been pulled from the consent agenda. So um, it's not on public hearing tonight. And so it's once we hear the 
presentation. It will be just be a discussion amongst the commissioners, unless there's, unless y'all open, unless y'all open the public hearing again. Okay. All right. Item two. Okay, item two is a request um, for rezoning from RS5 to SP zoning on property located at 1300 North 5th. Um, this is just north of Douglas Avenue and just east of the intersection of Douglas Avenue um, and Lishy. Um, since we have gone through this presentation before, I'm gonna move quickly through the parts that should be um, a review. Um, staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Um, as a reminder, it is zoned RS5 today and there is a um, mixed use and multifamily residential zoning um, to the south um, with residential zoning to the north. It is in T4 neighborhood evolving policy. Um, this policy was updated with the Highland Heights study, but the neighborhood evolving policy applicable to this site did not change. Um, so it has been neighborhood evolving. Um, the Highland Heights study included a building regulating plan, which focused um, on sort of the right building forms um, and design to achieve the goals of the, the policy in more detail. Um, this is in the R4 subdistrict, which supports um, both single family and multifamily uses and a range of building forms, um, including house, um, duplex, plex building or manor house and townhome. This is the plan for the site. There will be 10, up to 10 um, multifamily units in a single building um, with all of the parking and access um, taken from the alley to the rear of the site. Um, as a reminder, the building does have a setback consistent with the other um, homes on North 5th Street. Um, and it has a maximum height of 35 feet. Um, one of the things that came up during the previous discussion um, was the relationship of the um, the building height limitations to a requirement recommended by staff that it be designed as a manor home. Um, our feeling since this site was on a, um, the edge of a policy area that a manor home style building would help um, ensure that the building form and character were consistent with the existing neighborhood to the north. Um, and so staff went back and did some analysis of, um, of the different height requirements and the requirement for a pitched roof and actually prepared this elevation um, which the applicant did send an email saying that they were comfortable with this elevation being um, the requirement of the SP. But this illustrates a building that is the footprint of um, what they've shown on the site plan. Um, this is actually 33 feet in height from the foundation to the top of the roof. Um, and as you can see, it is three floors, although the third is actually accommodated within the pitch of the roof, um, which planning will sometimes describe as being a two and a half story building rather than a three three-story building. Um, so staff has updated our condition for height to reflect a two and a half story um, in 35 feet. Um, and this elevation would comply with that requirement. Um, so other than that, there have been no changes or additions to the, the application. Um, and again, staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions as we think um, as conditioned for this type of building form, um, this would provide an appropriate um, transition and, and fit the care of the neighborhood. Thank you. Vice Chair, you want to go first? Well, I guess I'm still, I, you know, so I know we decided not to reopen the public hearing, but I feel like we did have some questions. Some of this might be helpful to hear some stuff from the applicant, no? Just to kind of follow up on some of the It's It's issues. up to the commission, but um, it's really up, up to y'all. Does anybody else feel the need to talk at least to the applicant again, or am I the only one? The only thing I was wondering. You have to Sorry. get on your mic. The only thing I was wondering about, it was pulled off commission. Consent. I mean, pulled off consent, I'm sorry. Um, just, uh, was it an organization that pulled it off? Was it one specific? Lisa, do you, why was it pulled off the consent? You'd talk to the one of some of the neighbors? or A neighborhood resident asked for it to be pulled off of consent. We did explain that the public hearing is closed and they asked us to go ahead and hear the case so that you all could discuss it. Okay. So. 
Okay, well, then maybe, does anybody else care whether or not we open the public hearing? No. It probably would be quick. I mean, it's, there, there's, if there's only one resident, it's not like, or, or one, a couple, if you want to do it in caution, if the commission wants to do it in caution, I always try to be more transparent and cautionary than not. Well, I also feel like w we had a lot of questions of the applicant and we spoke a lot to the applicant at the, when we heard this the first time, so I sort of have some feeling like we should have a chance to hear their perspective on well, let's, what's changed. Let's do it proper then. If you feel like um, we should open the public hearing, let's make a motion. I'm sorry, I don't mean to extend anyone's night. <laughs> no, no, no it, I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we are here to okay. do public service for well, the community. Especially since it was pulled off. So. Okay, So. well then yes, I would like to go ahead and, and reopen the public hearing. Is that a motion? I would like to make a motion that we reopen the public that's hearing. That's a proper motion and a second. <laughs> Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of opening the public hearing, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, ayes have it. Declare the public hearing open, and is the applicant in the in the room? Come on up. You have 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Thank you for coming down. I am Clint Elliott. I am the land surveyor representing the client, and he asked me to come down and go over some of the plans. Um, we did go with a two and a half story. So I thought that would be better than the full three story. I know everybody is worried about the pitch of the roof and what that would look like. But as far as it being in the T4NE, you can have up to 40 units per acre in that zoning and we're well under that. Um, that's about all I have. And if you just state your name and your address. Clint right? Elliott. And address. Address? Yeah. It's uh, 7930 Highway 70 South. Thank you. Appreciate you coming down. We'll save two minutes uh, for rebuttal. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. Two minutes. State your name and address. Ashanti Davis, 321 Edwin Street, 37207. Thank you all for opening the public hearing. I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, we appreciate the work that planning staff has done and the work that the applicant has done to adjust the height. That address is one of our concerns. The next concern is that it's not really within the current zoning. It's 10 units. This is not really an alley. It's a dead end alley. So there's an access issue. This is at the beginning of an alley that dead ends. So normally an alley is another way to get in and out of a neighborhood and this isn't really like a complete alley. And so we're concerned about access it's too much density. It's actually more dense than the development to the south and the development to the north, which we did express concerns about in the planning study. And then the last thing, for 10 units to only have 15 parking spaces, we just think that that's inadequate. So I appreciate you guys opening uh, the public hearing. I kept it really brief, under two minutes, and I'm gonna let Courtney speak. Thank y'all. Thank you. Next, come on up. Hi. Courtney Williams, 1303 Lishy Avenue. I'm actually the lot directly behind this property. Um, I'm gonna mirror what Ashanti said. I appreciate the adjustments to height. I think that's a wonderful design choice. I think two and a half stories is much more in line, but I'm still in opposition. I think this is too dense. I think I've been here for this SP previously, and we talk about this lot as a transition. And at this point, we're maxing out. That's why it's an SP. And so I feel like to respect the house on the other side and the houses around. It's a single family footprint. It's not directly on Douglas. It's close, but I think it should be stepping down. And so even with the footprint we're talking about here and this parking, the density and the parking don't match up. So I don't know. I would just ask that you guys reconsider the amount of density that's going in this unit. As a, a neighbor who has been out here before telling you guys this is what we want and have joined neighbors, direct neighbors, around this specific property who have said this time and time again. And it's just too dense and I'd appreciate your consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, uh, two minutes for rebuttal from the applicant. Okay, seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Vice Chair, you want to start back up again? I'll try again. Try again. Um, you know, I think 
So I struggle because I think if you say 10 units, to me that does feel like a lot of units to have in a very, uh, and it is a congested corner. I mean, I've driven through this a few times and, and Fifth is a very narrow street. Um, but when I look at the design for it, I think you've done a very good job and I think the, devel the developer's done a very nice job of trying to come up with something that really, you know, you're not as aware of the fact that it's 10 units. So it does blend in nicely with the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I guess, the parking is a, I, you know, put, trying to put too many more cars on North Fifth would definitely be an issue. So if there's, you know, street parking is, it would definitely create some challenges for it for that area. I think, um, but I guess if staff and others have reviewed and feel the parking that's been suggested is sufficient, then. Um, you know, I don't have any reason to doubt that um, or not support that. So I think I'll listen to everybody else, but I'm leaning towards supporting this. Commissioner Tibbs. Yeah, I, um, I understand the concern about the extra density, but it, it seems like it's, um, you know, it follows what we would typically want on here. I think I may have said this last time, but, um, and if, like you said, if the parking is, um, you know, if it's compliant to what or what we normally would ask for, I, and I, I think the way that you guys have already tried to address the roof and, you know, address the height issue, that uh, I have to support it. Commissioner Elam. Can I ask the staff to, to address specifically what the policy says about parking? So the, the parking guidance would actually come from the, the zoning code rather than the policy. I think most of our policies focus on um, a lot on location of parking as it relates to creating pedestrian friendly um, streets and walkable areas. Um, so we do often look in, in our neighborhoods, our urban neighborhoods to have parking um, to the rear or beside structures rather than in front. Um, this particular site is parked um, at the standards that would be required um, by the code for multifamily development in the urban zoning overlay. Um, the urban zoning overlay actually stops at Douglas right now, but a recommendation of the Highland Heights study was that that be applied to um, the whole <coughs> Highland Heights study area in the future. With a specific plan, applicants can propose um, parking standards that are um, not precisely what's in the code. Um, and in looking in this and in reviewing it with the um, folks at Public Works who look at traffic and parking issues, um, this was, you know, staff felt that this would be appropriate. I think also um, there were some questions raised about the alley. We actually saw the fact that the alley doesn't go through um, as perhaps a benefit to the neighborhood because the traffic from this development would not um, seek to use North Fifth as a, as a primary access. Um, if they have to park off the alley and exit off the alley, they'll be funneled directly back to the corridor um, rather than moving through the neighborhood, so. Commissioner, any other questions? No, nope. okay. Commissioner Moore. So I do really appreciate the, um, the thought and the design and making it a two and a half story and making it um, look like the homes around it. I guess I still am struggling a little bit with the density though. Um, and I know that the parking has been, a, you know, that the number of parking spaces have been approved, but I guess it's still a bit of concern to me. Um, so I'm still a little bit torn. Commissioner Gallo. Well, I, I think I was the one that raised the question about the height and the proportions of it. So I think they've done a good job of solving those issues. Uh, if you put 10 units in this footprint, <clears throat> they're going to be about eight or 900 square feet, so they're going to be small units. Uh, so I'm very comfortable with staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims. Uh, <clears throat> First of all, thank you again, Ms. Davis, for always keeping an eye on your neighborhood. Um, I really have and I've been talking to the staff here, um, who I learn from every single day, um, about neighborhoods being defined by both space as well as the characteristics. And we are, I think, as a commission, working with one hand tied behind our back because we're not supposed to talk about affordability at all. So, okay, so we can't talk about that. 
but in this particular neighborhood, there does need to be homes where neighborhoods can stay there, where the neighbors who live there can stay there. And manor houses are used across our nation quite effectively in this way, and we haven't been using it that way. And I think this is a, so although Ms. Davis, I respect the heck out of you, I'm gonna vote for the staff here. I will need a motion. I move to support the staff's recommendation. That's a proper motion to, and there's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of staff's recommendation to approve, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. We are on to item 3A and 3B, which I have to recuse myself. I'm gonna hand over the chair to Vice Chair. expecting a changing of the guard. Okay, let's get started. All right, um, so for the commission, items 3A and 3B will be presented um, in sequence kind of as one presentation. Um, and then just as a reminder, if you, even if you discuss them together, you'll need to make two separate votes at the end. Um, so to begin with item 3A, this is a request to rezone from office residential intensive alternative to specific plan zoning um, on 1.47 acres of property located on the south side of Murphy Road. Um, you can see that outlined in red on the screen. It's currently occupied by a fifth third bank um, and associated parking. Um, and you can see the location of West End <coughs> Avenue running diagonally kind of southeast of the site, um, as well as Interstate 440 um, to the west of the site and the on-ramp for that immediately to the south. Staff's recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. This is an aerial view of the site in context. Um, as you heard some of the council members mention um, at the beginning, um, this is an area that's kind of a triangle bounded by Murphy Road, um, West End, and Interstate 440. Um, there are about 10 parcels of land in this area, um, and actually only three of them front Murphy Road. Um, the rest are oriented either to West End, um, or there are a few parcels um, just west of the site that orient, orient to Murphy Court court, um, which is this small street here. Um, so um, north of Murphy, you'll see you have some existing um, office buildings as well as some multifamily residential development. Um, and you'll see Park Drive, which runs here kind of parallel um, to Murphy Road. That's where those um, buildings get their access. Um, so they have quite a different relationship to um, Murphy Road than this development here. Um, the existing zoning on the site is office residential intensive alternative. It's also within a, a planned unit development, um, which currently permits the development that is on the site today. Um, you'll see that the office residential intensive zoning um, is predominant along this part of West End um, with some scattered mixed use. And then as you move away from the corridor um, to the north and west, you're seeing multifamily residential. Um, and then as you move further west across 440, you're in um, one and two family and single family residential, um, and the same to the south as you move away from West End Avenue. So this is the site plan for the development. Um, it is a, a building um, whose footprint occupies the majority of the site. It contains 378,700 square feet of all uses permitted by the Office Residential Intensive Alternative Zoning District, um, including active uses on the ground floor. All of the vehicular access um, to structured parking is provided um, from the alley to the east of the site and to the south, um, as well as the vehicular access to the hotel um, drop-off zone here. Um, there are sidewalk improvements along um, Murphy Road consistent with the major and collector street plan requirements, um, as well as an additional 16-foot um, pedestrian frontage zone um, that is partially covered and would, would provide opportunities for outdoor seating and dining um, along the sidewalk there. Um, the parking is consistent with the zoning code requirements based on the use mix anticipated at this preliminary stage. As I mentioned, all uses of the ORIA zoning district would be permitted. Um, so there is a specific condition from staff that it comply with the zoning code requirements for parking um, based on the use mix that's included in the final site plan. 
This is an elevation of the north side of the building, so this would be um, the side that faces Murphy Road. Um, the current proposal is for 16 stories in 207 and a half feet. Um, the primary pedestrian entrances to the building are along the Murphy Road frontage, um, and the building is built to the edge of the sidewalk with retail and restaurant on the ground floor um, to activate the street. Uh, so to step back for a moment and talk about the, the policy context for this site, this is the growth and preservation concept map which was included um, in the Nashville Next plan. Um, and one of the, the key um, sort of points of discussion and goals of Nashville Next was for the community to identify um, locations that could accommodate additional intensity and growth in order to protect the core and the heart of Nashville's residential neighborhoods. Um, and so those were identified um, as centers on the, the growth and preservation map. That um, orange color that you see is identifies a tier one center. Um, and those are identified as appropriate for additional growth and intensity. And they're often associated with major corridors, um, such as West End, which is identified as a priority transit corridor and a mixed-use arterial in the major and collector street plan. Um, this particular portion of Mur Murphy Road is also identified as a mixed-use arterial. Um, so it's bounded by two corridors in a tier one center. Um, Nashville Next also guided the application of our community character policies. Um, so those provide the next sort of layer of policy guidance um, in, our, in our plan. And um, this particular area was designated as a T5 center mixed use neighborhood. Um, those areas contain a significant amount of vertical mixed use development in buildings with high density residential and high intensity commercial and office uses. Um, the T5 mixed use neighborhood areas are intended to be among the most intense areas in the county outside of downtown. Um, and buildings in this policy have high lot coverage and are built to the sidewalk and activate and oriented to the street. And then as an additional layer of guidance in this area, um, we actually have the Midtown study. This was a special policy um, study that was completed in 2012 after about a two year public process. And it was adopted as part of Nashville Next. Um, the purpose was to provide more refined policy guidance um, to, get, to guide development in one of Nashville's major employment and education um, corridors. So it includes some general guiding principles as well as specific guidance on height and street hierarchy. Um, the map that you're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen with the varying shades of pink um, is the height guidance map. Um, and I've circled this site in red at the bottom um, near kind of the boundary between the pink and yellow. Um, this is in an area identified as appropriate for buildings of eight to 20 stories in height. Um, and then on the right side, you see the street um, connections map from the Midtown study. Um, and that identifies Murphy Road as a primary street, um, which provides more intense urban development and accommodates high levels of vehicular and pedestrian activity um, with shallow build two zones and active ground floor uses. Um, so as I mentioned, this is in a tier one center and it's in a T5 um, mixed use neighborhood policy. Um, it's also in a portion of the Midtown study identified as appropriate for buildings of up to 20 stories. Um, but as you can see on this policy map, it is on an edge. Um, so across Murphy Road to the north, we have this um, pale purple color is an area of urban neighborhood evolving um, policy. And then obviously we have more residential areas as you move across the interstate. Um, so so staff gave um, significant feedback um, given the unique context of this site um, to try to ensure that the building height and massing and other design factors were appropriate um, and ensure that the development would be consistent with the policy guidance that we have for this location. Um, this is a rendering of the proposed building. Um, this view you're looking um, sort of east um, along Murphy Road towards West End Avenue. Um, this represents a reduction in height of over 100 feet from the initial submittal. Um, I think the other thing to note is that in response to staff comment, um, the applicant has shifted the, the mass of the tower element 
um, away from Murphy Road and Murphy Court, and therefore away from some of those residential areas, toward West End and the interstate. Um, and given the policy along West End, that's where we would anticipate more intensity. So the most intense part of this building, the, the biggest mass part of the, the tallest part of the building mass has now been shifted towards the more intense <laughs> policy area. Um, and that was something that, that staff was focused on to try to make sure that their relationship at the street um, was correct and that we had the intensity in the areas most closely policied in that manner. So as the proposed SP um, is in keeping with that overall Nashville Next goal um, to try to locate intensity in our centers and away from the core of our residential neighborhoods, um, it's also consistent with the, the uses um, and the guidance provided in the T5 mixed use neighborhood policy and with the more specific design guidance in the Midtown study, um, staff is recommending approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Um, and then to go quickly through the associated item 3B, um, this is a request um, for cancellation of a planned unit development overlay district that applies to this site. As I mentioned, staff is recommending approval subject to the approval of the associated zone change and disapproval if the associated zone change is not approved. Um, this particular pod permits the, the bank and parking that is on site today. At, at one point, it also included a hotel that has never been constructed. Um, and so staff would recommend that if the zone change is approved, the pod be canceled as well. Thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. Is the applicant here? You wanna come forward? If you could start with your name and address, you'll have 10 minutes and you can hold two minutes for rebuttal. Hi, my name is Joe Booker. I'm with Gresham Smith and Partners. We um, are serving as a design architect on the project. Um, a lot of this has been very eloquently stated by Sean, but the, the project kind of places the density to support the uh, growth of the city where it seems kind of most appropriate. Um, it's really not inside of a residential neighborhood, but against the commercial corridor and at the intersection of an interstate node. Um, during this process, uh, we got a lot of feedback from planning staff. We've really tried to adjust, adjust this building and try to thoughtfully place the massing of this building where it's kind of most appropriate and respond to kind of the future growth of the West End Corridor and how we think that this, this, this entire area will, will develop over time. Um, really, you know, shifting that mass towards the West End Corridor provides a step down in the structure, uh, which rightfully kind of lowers the intensity uh, as it moves to down Murphy Road and back towards the, the residential neighborhood and makes the building kind of respond back to where the commercial intensity will be uh, likely growing in the future. Uh, but in addition, it does some interesting things to the way the building's oriented. It kind of uses the building mass itself to shield the neighborhood and the interstate to the west uh, really of a lot of the commercial uses. So the, for example, the, the ground floor retail or the, com and the hotel use, um, those things will actually face Murphy Road, right? and the building mass itself will kind of uh, stop those things from kind of interjecting noise or, or, or light back at the, at, towards the west, back at the, uh, at the neighborhood, uh, which becomes important. Um, you know, we, we're, we'll do things at this building that we would to change it a little bit if we were doing a downtown building, right? We'll tone down the reflectivity on the glass a little bit, you know? It won't be quite as reflective. That'll, that'll be important, you know? We still have to maintain this kind of energy responsiveness and the building needs to respond to the environment in the right way, but using an energy efficient glass, you know, it will cut down on the light pollution that comes from an office building, and cut down on the glare that people see from, from, from their homes. Uh, and we, we will also use indirect lighting on the skyline signage as it faces back towards these homes. So that you don't get that kind of beacon or light effect uh, from front yards or as, as you're approaching up to these buildings. Um, probably worth noting that this building and this site, the corner of the site is 650 feet as the crow flies to the nearest single family residence and that would be across the interstate. Um, uh, this, it's important because any sort of kind of ambient noise of the interstate would kind of drown out any any noise from the development. And we've heard some complaints about noise in, in our community meetings. We're trying to be responsive to those kinds of things uh, as we sit up here. Um, and the you know the streetscape character I don't think can be understated. So uh, as we worked with. Uh, planning staff on the orientation design of the building. What we really wanted to do was activate the entire site as much as we can. Take the services of a building, which every building has to have a back end, 
be able to service a building of this size and place those things along the alleyway, along the back side of the building and completely activate Murphy Road, really widening the character and improving that entire walkability, uh, which is currently surface parking lots and, uh, and driveway entrances. So it's, it's a pretty dramatic change to uh, an improvement along that, that entire edge. Um, we feel it's a thoughtful and appropriate response uh, to not just uh, uh, the, the West End as it exists today, but West End as it develops uh, towards the future and how it supports our, our future growth of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Ostrowski. I'm a registered professional engineer in Tennessee. I represent KCI Technologies, which is formerly RPM Transportation Consultants. A traffic study for this development was completed by our team in June 2018. Our study was prepared in conformance with Metro guidelines and reviewed and approved by Public Works. The study included eight intersections surrounding the development and data was collected in March 2018 um, with both Metro schools and all of the local universities in session. Um, this information was used to determine the existing traffic conditions. To establish projected traffic volumes, we followed standard practices consistent with Metro's traffic impact study guidelines, and in order to evaluate the impacts of the development, we conducted capacity analysis of the existing and projected traffic volumes. As the proposed development is located in an area with a, a mix of uses, um, it will, and it has a mix of uses, it'll generate um, pedestrian traffic and have opportunities for transit use. Um, due to the mix of uses planned for the project, internal trips um, between the various uses in the development will occur. For these reasons, the development will generate um, significantly less vehicular traffic than sim similar sized developments in a suburban setting. Um, our team worked closely with Public Works to identify appropriate intersection and traffic improvements, making sure that vehi vehicular and pedestrian traffic is accommodated. Our analyses show that the intersection improvements proposed will mitigate the traffic impacts of the development. With the planned improvements, the study intersections will operate at similar levels of service in the future with the developments and um, improvements as they would in the future without the developments and without improvements. Um, the study recommended the following improvements, I'm gonna summarize here, um, that were ultimately conditioned by Public Works. At West End Avenue and Murphy Road, the phasing and timing of the traffic signal will be modified to eliminate the split phasing for Murphy Road and Orleans Drive. This recommendation results in much more efficient operations. Um, under projected conditions with these improvements, there will be a, an actual reduction in delay of over 30 seconds as compared to the existing 2018 conditions for the PM peak. Um, the AM peak also sees a net improvement, existing versus projected. So existing 2018 versus projected 2021 for the AM. At Murphy Road and Murphy Court and the I-440 ramps, a traffic signal is will be warranted and will be installed. The concrete median will on 2440 will be removed um, to allow through movements from Murphy Court. And it's worth noting that the in order to put in the signal, that approach will be narrowed. The throat will have to be narrowed to install the signal, and there'll be a cross the crossing distance will be shortened there. The um, northbound approach of Mur Murphy Court will be widened to provide one ingress lane and two egress lanes, and pedestrian improvements including crosswalks, ADA compliant pedestrian ramps, pedestrian signals with push buttons and countdown timers will be added. The improvements result in a level of service C under projected conditions, and that mitigates an existing level of service D under existing conditions, that's for AM and PM. At Murphy Road and Alley 1138, which is to the east, the northbound approach of the alley will be widened to, improve, to provide one ingress lane and two egress lanes. Um, and then additionally, the um, study was conditioned with coordinating the um, study, signalized study intersections. Um, a number of travel demand management strategies were recommended per discussions with planning. Bike lane improvements along Murphy Road were conditioned per discussions with planning. Um, and following the completion of the traffic study, the developer has been continuing to coordinate with Public Works and has agreed to make a financial contribution towards traffic calming improvements in the Hillsborough West End neighborhood. Um, this will be need to be coordinated through the Metro Traffic Calming Group. 
Finally, um, the conditions as submitted with, by Public Works are consistent with the recommendations as presented in the traffic study based on the analyses conducted and the conditions um, recommend it, the conditioned recommendations, these recommendations will provide safe and efficient traffic operations within the study area, providing the completion of the proposed project. Thanks. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, members of the commission, James Weaver, Waller, Lanston. Uh, I would like to um, ask the commission just to we have a letter that we've submitted that contains a lot of photos, a lot of other information that might, may be useful during your deliberations or you know, hearing the rest of the comments today. But at this point, I'd just like to reserve the 130 that I've got left uh, for rebuttal. So thank you. Thanks. Okay. So anyone here speaking in support of the project? If you would please come forward. Um, and if you want to go ahead and line up, you'll each have two minutes. You have, uh, if you can start with your name and address. Steve Kolinsky. My address is 1125 Belvedere Avenue. And uh, I'm with CBRE. I represent the, uh, the seller of the property. Uh, and I know there's a lot of people here in support, but I just want to take a second and see who all here is in support. Do I have a raise of hands? Okay. Thank you. As I, as I mentioned, we uh, represent the seller. The building is obsolete. We, we have no use for it. The seller has no use for it. So it will be sold. It, it will be redeveloped. And if this project doesn't go forward, uh, it'll probably be sold to a multifamily developer. Base zoning uh, allows you to, uh, to put up 10, 10 floors of, uh, of an apartment building, which uh, I, I think is going to add a whole lot of joggers up and down that, the, the greenway. Um, but. Um, I was going to go through and start telling it how it meets the community plan, but I think Joe and Sean has already addressed those points, so I'm not going to go, go back over it. But the points I do want to make, the developer has spent a lot of time meeting with the community, getting community input, and this is in addition to the input that, that is re required for the community plan. So there has been a whole lot of uh, community input, and a lot of it has been very, very, very positive. Um, so from the seller's viewpoint, we want to see this go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission. My name is Alex Ryan. I actually live at uh, 3415 West End Avenue, uh, which is directly across the street. Um, bear with me just one second. I've got my notes here. <laughs> um, my unit's actually 150 feet from uh, the temporary Fifth Third Bank portion of the property. Uh, it's about 300 feet from the heart of the project. Um, and as someone who lives amongst the closest to the development, um, I feel like it's important for you to know what I think. <laughs> um, I think it's a great project. Um, I, th I think you should approve it. I think the planning staff was actually smart to recommend the approval. Um, and, and here's why. Uh, I think we need more urban designs like these uh, along the key corridors. We need walkable, bikeable, transit-oriented developments uh, in this city. Um, for me, um, we need more walkable retail and food options. You know, when, I, when I'm home in the afternoon um, or on weekends, I look for reasons to get out of my car. And this is something that's going to help. Um, as for when I am in my car, I have reviewed the traffic study. Uh, I'm excited about the improvements um, that are going to be made uh, inside of that area um, nearest to me. Um, so you may be wondering kind of, you know, how I reached this conclusion. GBT Realty actually conducted um, a meeting inside of our apartment complex. Um, and I want to thank them for that, uh, as well as um, the council, the councilwoman Berkeley Allen. Uh, they've been very forthcoming. They've been willing to make changes. I think that's another thing that says a lot to me about this, is that they're actually acting in good faith. So I urge you to support it. Thank, thank you very you. much. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name's Rusty Dunn. I live at 212 Belclair Place. I'm in the neighborhood also. Um, I agree a lot with the last gentleman that, uh, you know, 
it's great if we could have more restaurants right in that area of town, walk about. Uh, it's, it's, uh, looks like to me it's an ideal location for this kind of project because the interstate dust dumps right by the project. It's not going to create a lot of traffic issues, especially not going to bog down like West End, or that sort of thing. I think a hotel, if we could get that in the area, would be great. Uh, it would also give these Airbnbs that are popping up all in that particular area a little competition because we really don't have any kind of hotels close by. So I'm in support of it. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in support? Anybody here speaking in opposition? If you will also come up and um, go ahead and line up, depending on how many there are. Uh, same thing, you'll have two minutes. And start with your name and address. It's Robin Johnson, 3728 Richland Avenue. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to address this meeting. I've owned and lived at 3728 Richland Avenue for 25 years. I'm presenting on behalf of 127 residents of the Richland West End neighborhood who have signed a letter strongly opposing the zoning change that would make the construction of this building possible. The letter that we've submitted to the commission outlines our concerns, which include the, pro the proposed project height and floor area that are nearly double what is currently allowed by existing zoning. They are simply out of scale for this location. The project will have a negative impact on traffic on Murphy Road, West End Avenue, Bowling Avenue, and other anticipated cut-through routes in our neighborhood. The project will have a significant and negative impact on the 3,500 blocks of Richland Avenue, Central Avenue, and West End Circle. These neighbors are already dealing with overflow parking from existing retail and office space in the area. The project will generate light and noise pollution. The project incorporates essentially no green space or tree canopy. And there are major concerns that this zoning change and massive project scale will set a dangerous precedent for development along both West End and Murphy Road corridors. Our neighborhood has a long history of advocacy and making our voices heard in order to preserve what we believe to be one of the best places to live, not just in this city or state, but in the country. But we're not against all development, just development that is dramatically out of scale with its surroundings and the current zoning as this project is. The neighbors of Richland West End who have signed this letter are urging that you deny the developer's request for a zoning change. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Wesley Weeks. I live at 3705 Bridgeland, which is about 3,000 feet from the proposed project. I'd like to say I think we're not opposed to the project itself. We like the mixed-use concept. We like the idea of having a hotel nearby. The problem is with the scale. At 378,700 square feet, it's about 75% of the same size as the Batman building or the Pinnacle building, which are both around 500,000 square feet. It's hard to imagine that you would think it would be appropriate at this location right adjacent to these neighborhoods that a 20-story building or even a 16-story building would be appropriate. It's too much size. There's nothing, no human scale about this project. Um, all the neighborhoods around it are fairly quiet. It's the western quarter. Uh, where this should be located would be farther east in the Gulch and South Broadway or something like that. The community plan that's been referenced is appears to be a remnant of the old uh, attempt to adopt the AMP or BRT, which we know was rejected in the past. I know that they tried to increase the density along the corridor in order, under the plans, in order to demonstrate to the Federal Transportation Administration that they had sufficient density to support the project. We all know that that project didn't move forward and there's not an adequate plan for the additional traffic that's gonna be created by this. I've asked for a specific copy of the traffic study but haven't been able to get one. Our concerns are the West End Murphy Road uh, intersection's already bad. If they're gonna add another light, perhaps two, if they're talking about adding one at Elmington Park, people are gonna cut through our neighborhood. 
through Ackland Park to get over to East Nashville or farther east down West End and avoid all the traffic that's going to be created by this. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lauren Benton. I live at 3335 Ackland Avenue, and I want to speak uh, very forcefully against this proposal. Um, Ackland Avenue, as you might have seen on the map, is a, and, and Orleans lead off West End Avenue, and they currently cannot support the traffic that they have. The current situation is very dangerous. Uh, very hazardous for residents. Ackland Avenue is so narrow that it does not have a line painted down the middle. It can't sustain that because it has no shoulders and traffic it's, uh, uh, weaves up and down it. Uh, there has been a city study that shows hundreds of cars at two rush hours uh, in the day. Uh, and this situation is, is very difficult to live with now. Residents have been in touch with the city on a continual basis to ask for help with this. We've gotten very little help with this. So the, 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 the staff report uh, shows, and the traffic study of the developer shows, that there will be many additional trips added with a building of this size. And we know from the way traffic flows in this neighborhood that those uh, visitors and those office workers are going to be pouring through Little Ackland Avenue, Little Orleans. There's no place else for them to go if they're cutting through to Hillsborough. So our res historic residential neighborhood is a favorite cut through and it shows up on Google Maps. So it's not as if you have to be an insider to know that this is the cut through to take. Um, so we're very concerned and rightfully so about the additional traffic and what this is going to mean, mean for safety in our neighborhood and for, uh, and for the um, uh, quality of life in our neighborhood. We ask for uh, a deferral so that we can have real conditions put in, not just okay. the offer of conversation Thank you about very much. those further improvements. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Gary Leda, 3606 Meadowbrook Avenue. I've lived uh, at that residence since 1979. So I've seen a real increase in traffic on Murphy Road and West End over that amount of time. And I note that often traffic on uh, the exit ramp from I-440 onto Murphy Road backs up all the way down into the interstate. I think putting another traffic light on Murphy Road is going to back that traffic up even more, even if that exit ramp is widened to allow two lanes to exit onto Murphy. Another point I'd like to make is that um, the plan that's being referenced often talks about uh, the, the um, mass transit and their mass transit has not been approved, and until it is, a hotel of this size is only going to complicate traffic even more at that intersection of Murphy Road and West End. Also, there are several hotels already in the area. There are several down around Vanderbilt, and on West End, directly across from Murphy Road, there's an extended stay hotel. Uh, Mr. Kendall noted that uh, he lives in, an, in a residential area and he doesn't have tall buildings. And I, he, he mentioned that tall buildings are limited to downtown. And I would like to point out that yes, they should be limited to downtown. As I was driving out here today, I noted that most of the tall buildings around the interstate don't seem to be as big as the building that this is going to be. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you very much. Um, my name is Eli Ball. I am. I live at uh, 34. What's our street number? <laughs> I live on Ackland Avenue, about a block o off of uh, West End. Um, there have been some interesting things talked about today. 
I can't imagine, you know, what you guys have to go through. I'm looking at 28 items on the agenda. I'm like, I'm a banker, and I would just like pass this off to somebody. You'd have to deal with it yourself. Uh, the issue is really context, and I kind of wanted to give you that based on both sides of what everyone said, which is there's no single neighborhood for, in, in, that's going to be affected by this. It's literally that's the intersection of four different neighborhoods, all of which intersect with each other. If you're a cyclist, if you're a walker, I envy the, my neighbors or my friends that live on Belmont and over on 12th that they're able to walk and they've maintained some sense of, sorry, I keep hitting this, I don't need it, um, some sense of community. In the banking business, and we do transactions in 32 countries, you measure three times and you cut once. And no disrespect, um, I think the appropriate thing here for both sides, because we definitely, I love the idea, it's really, what is the design appropriate for the four neighborhoods around it to keep them connected together, to keep us connected to McCabe Park from the other side of the street? I would ask you to defer it and give us time to measure it a couple, three times before you start cutting. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else speaking in opposition? If not, then the applicant will have a minute 30, or are you giving them two minutes? Oh. All right. can't do a minute that. 30. A minute I'll 30. try to do a minute 30. James Weaver again, Waller Lanston for the applicant GBT. The project as presented to you today is consistent with uh, the commission approved community plan. It's consistent with the special policy for the area and it's uh, consistent with National Next and the updated National Next that was done after the, uh, after the AMP thing uh, went away. The project team at GBT has earned staff support uh, and recommendation after three months of, I was trying to think how I was going to describe these negotiations. Uh, excruciating is a word, but I wouldn't use that, but uh, not with the executive director sitting in front of me. But the detailed and careful negotiations over every single aspect uh, of, this, of this design. And finally, and most importantly, this project was not conceived in a vacuum. Multiple and massive revisions have been made to the project design after four separate community meetings, two meetings with the Richland Board, a meeting with the Richland Presidents, there are two of them, door-to-door -door canvassing at over 300 homes in the neighborhood, a couple of hundred phone calls to people in the neighborhood to find out if they had any questions, Significant feedback, and I mean significant, from three highly engaged council members and the aforementioned um, three-month process with, with your staff. Um, Nashville has growing pains like every city has, but if we're going to continue to progress and grow as a city, then we must allow reasonable, thoughtful growth in areas that are identified in your plans as places where growth is appropriate and had the infrastructure already in place to handle it. This is a responsible project in a location designated in a community plan for exactly what we are proposing. It was brought to you by a local company that literally bent over backwards to have a fair, inclusive, and meaningful process of input from multiple voices. Okay. It is that inclusive process of listening to those various voices that have produced the plan in front okay. of you. We Thank ask for you your approval. Thank you, so Madam much. Chair. Okay. All right, commissioners. Um, maybe. Yeah. Commissioner Tibbs, can I let you get us started? Sure. Um, well, first, I, um, I'm very familiar with this area, as, as Commissioner Berkeley brought up. Um, I, am, I am glad that the uh, original, I guess it's almost 100 feet, was taken off of it originally. I, uh, do you mind going back to the rendering, too? Um, so, um, just first a couple questions. I did hear there was a lot of... Uh, well, maybe it was from the applicant about the um, 
how the street was activated, but it looks like the entry is on the um, back side, or is that just a drop off back there and there is a pedestrian walk, pedestrian access here? Um, so there are a number of ways that you could enter this building. So um, it's kind of difficult to see because it's covered, but outside of the, there's a, a 16 foot area that's a sidewalk and a planning strip that's in public right of way. And there's an additional <laughs> 16 feet that is under, um, what looks like this sort of white oh, <coughs> shelf here. Mm -hmm. um, that is also pedestrian space and um, the, the ground floor um, retail space is open to that sidewalk. So there would be opportunities for um, seating or dining in that area outside of the public sidewalk um, and there are entrances there. Okay, and is there, well, I know this is getting to you, so, it's, so there is like a retail kind of planned on that. Um, could you go, there was also a drawing, it was like a uh, black and white drawing that showed a elevation of it. Um, I did have um, a little concern, is this all, well maybe it's not, maybe it's just the way the shadows, is that parking that's shown up behind there? Um, that's what I was thinking that was when I first saw it. Is uh, this the parking garage we're looking at? So there, there is parking um, sort of to all of the, the sides of the building. There are, um, there's architectural screening and cladding that doesn't, I think, show up well on this elevation. They were probably trying to help staff figure out what was going on. There's also a specific condition from staff that relates to the cladding and screening of those areas to ensure when the materials are chosen at final that we're being sensitive to light bleed and those kinds of issues. Because I would be, cons I guess I'm looking at the Murphy Road side of it and, uh, you know, the other side is the uh, interstate, but I know it's, I guess it's going to be also the front door. It's, it seems like it'd be more um, that way. And I know we're, like I said, this is getting more into the design. It's not necessarily the planning of it. Um, but... Um, yeah, honestly, you know, and go back just for my other one about the shows, the uh, quarter, that drawing. Yeah, that's good. The orange one oh, is good. The orange. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it, this, this is very consistent with what we, um, you know, what our plan was. Uh, although I, I know it, uh, you know, it is tall for the side, but it just seems like if you're going to do it, this will be the appropriate place to do it. I remember when that... Um, uh, fifth third was built and it seemed always a little weird almost to be there honestly because it was so residential almost kind of looking with this parking lot so uh, maybe this is completely opposite that I guess but still I, I feel like it's this is um, I'd be supportive of it I, I do want to make sure that um, the things that you know Councilman Murphy brought up about connection to the uh, Greenway 440 Greenway is there and um, I didn't hear it, the owner talk I mean he talked a little bit about it okay so I, I definitely want to make sure that that's in there um, also um, and it sounds like from the parking study that the reciprocals were going to be really uh, evaluated uh, that Ackland cut through, I, I'll admit that from the um, lady who said it, that is real. Um, you know, I cut through there too, so it is a real little cut through. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> how will you mitigate that? I'm not sure. I, for some reason, I feel like though the way these, the, a lot of the people are coming here, they are going to be jumping in and jumping off and on the um, um, interstate. But, uh, but it is, I, I do understand and sympathize with that, um, and, and probably more that, honestly, than what happens back where I get off at Elmington more so, actually. But how that might, you know, I don't know how that may be um, um, considered in the SP, but some kind of way to, some, I don't know how it can be addressed, but that could be a concern. But as far as the building, I think right there on the edge is good, and I think I would probably, uh, support Councilman Kendall's you know, motion just to keep going forward with it, and any other thing that's happened happens during a, you know, when it gets to council. <laughs> Commissioner Elon. Curious um, if staff could, or maybe how staff did assess the existing buildings and in, in inform, if at all, and in informing the height recommendations. Sure, um, I'm actually gonna go forward a bit because we have some photos. Um, 
So this is kind of standing on the site looking back towards West End, um, and we did look at the sort of heights of the surrounding structures. Um, obviously, immediately across Murphy from this site, you have the building that you see um, on the screen. It's the Highwoods office building, um, and the, the height of that structure is 157 feet. Um, and then we looked at some of the other office buildings around the Murphy West End intersection, um, and they're somewhere between 95 and 120. Um, and then there are also some lower buildings. Um, I think one of the things we were um, looking at was also the relationship of building height to the street. Um, the, the buildings on the other side of Murphy um, are set back differently, um, and so we were sort of grappling with the, um, the need and the, the policy guidance to create an urban and a vibrant walkable streetscape um, and, and how to balance that with the existing development. I think the policy speaks to stories. Um, we found it helpful to start talking in feet because um, over time, what constitutes a story, you know, sort of market preference for floor to floor heights has changed. Um, and so what you might describe as, um, you know, a, a 10 story building today um, would not be um, something that would be equivalent to, um, you know, what people are seeing across the street. Um, like that number of feet would equate to much fewer stories probably than is in the Highwoods building. Um, now, So we were looking at all of that in context, and I think also anticipating that the policy um, supports 8 to 20 stories, and um, it focuses that um, on the corridor. And this isn't on the corridor, um, but the site right behind it is. And so if there were anywhere we would anticipate additional height happening um, in consistency with the policy, it would be kind of right at this intersection. Um, and so we felt this was actually stepping down from the maximum that the policy um, would suggest um, in a way that was appropriate. The other, thing I might the other thing I might add, if I could just tap onto that, is some of the taller buildings in the area seem to us to be more suburban in profile. Their setbacks were different. Um, one of them actually has a large drive aisle. They don't feel like places where folks would want to necessarily walk if you weren't doing business in the building. And so from our perspective, the policy and the site itself, the configuration of the site wants something that's more urban in profile and that is more pedestrian friendly. That's an expressed goal of the policy as well as the, um, I think some of the things that we heard from the, the neighborhoods that they wanted something that you know felt good when you walked past it. And so I think while we took our cues from the context and certainly felt that the initial proposal for 300 feet was not appropriate. We didn't feel that it was necessary to mimic the existing context with those buildings, just given those factors. Thank you. The, the uh, Council Lady Murphy had suggested that the plan had changed at some point. I thought she suggested from the last community meeting, and I'm curious from the applicant if that is so, and, and, and how did it change? Erica Yurison with Waller Lanston. I will say the last community meeting that was held um, a, a few days ago, the plan had not changed. The plan has changed before that, um, but the main reduction was a reduction in height. The reduction in height was the, was the most significant change. The only other change that was of note was obviously the tower moving um, in the direction of West End. Those were the two main changes. The floor plates and um, the interaction on the floor level in the retail and the flow of the traffic and the traffic study, none, none of that significantly changed. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. So, Lucy, thank you for the explanation. That actually helped me because that was kind of my question. Um, I can understand why some of the neighbor, uh, the neighbor, surrounding neighborhoods feel a little uneasy about this, but I do, it is obviously, especially after looking at the growth and preservation map um, and the policy that is pretty appropriate for this area, um, especially being near West End, the corridor there, um, and being near the interstate. Um, and I believe the councilman is very sincere in saying that he's gonna to continue to work through this process as it moves forward in council, so um, I'm inclined to support it. Thank you, Commissioner Hobble. Um, I got. Can you go back to this kind of the base plan? Just 
So I got one quick right there. So this thing in the middle of this, that's actually just a breezeway. The, Correct. The building bridges over the mm -hmm. top of that. So yes. if you pull to the back, you can walk to the front and connect. That's right. Okay. Um, sort of through the building, but but it's an open. All right. I, I, that makes sense. I, um, you know, I, I think this is consistent with policy, and I think the staff's done an excellent job of working to uh, meet reasonable goals, and, you know, I'm very comfortable in supporting it. I do think Council Lady Allen had had uh, some good suggestions about a pedestrian refuge and a traffic calming uh, situation, and I think Council Lady Murphy on supporting the Greenways is always a good idea. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I am inclined to support the staff's recommendation. Commissioner Sims? Um, I actually really enjoyed doing this the study on this one because um, it's not often you get this much robust data from the community and both pro and con. And so I really compliment the people who have done unbelievable work in having so many of the community meetings and thus rich fodder for us to really digest in terms of looking at this thing. Um, there was one thing that was brought up in uh, quite, I mean, it's a significant uh, finding from the community about the rooftop bar that I didn't hear addressed at all, or maybe I just slipped during that part. <laughs> can, you come, can you come forward? Sorry. Um, we, we do not have a rooftop bar designed into this project. Was it taken out or? Yeah. No. Oh, it was taken, okay. Because that was the one thing was, we got lots of com comments on from the people, okay. There, there is an amenity space for the um, office building. Okay, basis. oh good, okay. Well, it feels to me, what is, I know that we had one council person who wanted to defer. What would be the consequences to defer this at her request? Is, what would happen? I mean, typically we defer if we think that there is a, a major technical issue that needs to be sorted out. I'm not, I'm not hearing that here. Or if we think that ad additional engagement um, could benefit the project. Um, I think the, you know, it's really to, count, given that it's in Councilman Kendall's district, it is really to him to guide and shepherd the project mm -hmm. um, today or, or next week mm -hmm. if, if deferred. Mm -hmm. um, so it's mm -hmm. typically, you know, project costs and sort of moving forward is um, the just implication, like, if that's what you... Yeah, I just like to respect our council people's request if we can, if there's a reason to, or if for some reason it won't really matter, then I don't see that we have to. But um, I do know that in our community, as things really change, I know I lived not far from the Gulch at the time when the Gulch went through, uh, and I was one of those people screaming about it, and then now I love it. And so I know there is a place that we will go through these changes as a city as we grow to be even bigger city. And I actually usually try to come down on the side of the neighborhood if I can, but in this case, I think all of this is just an appropriate place at an appropriate time. And with people who are very, very willing to to listen even more. And we take you at your word, council person, that you'll do that, so. Can I ask a couple questions? Um, is there anything, I, I think I said there was no standard on signage. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, I, I'm, so the picture that's actually sticking, getting concerning to me is one that you provided by the applicant that looks at the perspective of this building from 3505 Central Avenue. And I'm just starting to think if there's signage at the top of the building that faces back towards the neighborhood, that's going to be somewhat of a a glaring thing into the neighborhood. So I'm just wondering what the signage requirements are. Sure, so the, um, as conditioned by staff, it would just need to comply with the, the standard sign requirements of the ORIA zoning district. So we felt keeping it with the zoning that's in place there now. Um, so that places limitations on ground signs and building signs. Um, the ground signs are probably less of an issue, um, it sounds like, so I'll focus on the building signs first. Um, basically, um, there can 
to be two building signs um, of not more than 48 square feet that are related to the principal um, primary signage for the building. That's not including directional signage, you know, park here, turn, um, things like that. And then there could be two building signs if it's a multi-tenant building um, for each occupant on the exterior of their portion. And then there's a size limit um, on their um, signage that's based on the, the percent of the facade of their exterior portion. So um, it's one of those things that's very difficult to pin down exactly until we have um, more details on the uses and which portions of the building that they're going to occupy. Um, but basically staff was trying to ensure that the signage would not be different um, than, than what the zoning, that's the base zoning in place on this property um, would allow today if it were redeveloped in that manner. But so I know you don't have this picture in front of you, um, I, or do you have it? I think I can get to it if you'll bear with me just a second. Um. Maybe, I'm not, we'll see if this is the one you're referring to. Okay. I don't know what page it is. <laughs> it's the picture of from 3505 Central Avenue. Here we go. So, it's further down. Okay. I think it's I number it's three. I think it's number three. Yeah. Sean. Okay. It's getting there. Yeah, that's yeah, there it is. Okay. So, I mean, if I if I look at the site plan, it seems to me that's the side that's the hotel. Um, I just, you know, I could picture a big residence in going across the top <laughs> because that's what you're going to want to see coming off the interstate, and I could see that being intrusive to the neighborhood. So, I'm just wondering if one of the things we might want to consider is some conditions on signage. Um, you know, I don't know what kind of conditions well, we already have. I think why don't we it. pose to the staff, to the applicant, to address how they imagine the signage working given the ORI conditions, and then we can contemplate if we want to add some additional restrictions based on the testimony. Sure. Um, in a uh, letter stated to, um, to the commission, uh, we listed that uh, sign light, sign in, skyline signage facing the neighborhood um, would be indirectly lit signage. So we can do that with either backlighting the sign or sign or lighting the face of it rather than internally lit signage. That would cut down on the uh, the visibility of, the, of, of those pieces but still make it uh, work for us. Um, in addition, um, we would omit sky, any skyline signage from the western face of the building. So that would be actually the face that we're looking at right here. Um, that is actually the office building that you're okay. seeing in the distance and not the hotel. The hotel is lower in the building and closer to the street and the office building sits above. So okay. we okay. sent that in a, a, a letter that is in the packet of the pieces that you have in front of you. Okay. Are you willing to accept that? Um, okay. I'm sorry, can we just clarify, in the, is the letter in our packet? Is it part yes. of our conditions? Okay. That are in the staff room. So the letter was provided with the materials that were on your desks when you arrived today. The, the only condition in the staff recommendation is just that signage be compliant with ORIA. So you may want to restrict in line with what's in the letter as sort of an additional um, condition. Okay, thank you. One more question for you. Um, so you had a height map that showed on your in, in the regular presentation, staff presentation. So you have the height map, and that's so it's the mid-rise eight to twenty. What's the yellow right behind it? The yellow represents um, properties that are in the thirty-first and long urban design overlay, um, and that has different subdistricts that allow different um, things. I'm glancing back to see if our policy folks could speak um, more specifically um, to the different height restrictions, but that's why the, the yellow is a different color because there is an okay. urban design overlay that. Um, 
controls that area. I will say that I, I believe that generally um, in that subdistrict, um, you're looking at heights of five or six stories, and this building at the street um, goes up to about six stories before you get that first set of articulations. Mm -hmm. um, so we were trying to, to be sort of um, respectful of what would happen across the street as well. Okay. Um, well, I think I'm sort of the, the outlier among my fellow commissioners, but I, it, it's feeling to me like this is too, uh, and I understand, I like the project, I like the mixed use, um, I agree that we need the density close to West End, I still feel like this building, I'm with Kathleen, with Councilman Murphy, I still feel like it's just a little too big, um, but, you know, I'm one voice. Um, any other points of discussion? Anybody want to make a motion? And again, I'm sorry, we have to remember we're voting on two items. We're voting on items 3A and 3B. So 3A would be the um, item that's dealing with a specific plan, and the second is the PUD cancellation. I'm willing to do this. I just want to make sure that I've captured everything, though. Like, um, for instance, the signage part, that was part of their letter um, as making that. Um, and, and the things I may not need to, do I need to bring up about the, the foot Councilman um, Murphy, um, Allen, Berkeley Allen brought up? I want to make sure that. So um, that's my only things. I want to make sure that I get the right ones in here okay. that are not already there. Some of them I think maybe they actually covered. I'm asking to see, somehow I didn't get the, the package with the signage. You got it? Okay. The light. Okay. What page? The last page of the GBT. Okay. We don't know if we can reference that in as a condition. Bob, do you have any thoughts on that? Just it sounds like the commission liked the signage recommendations just to take that one first. Yeah, I think if we just reference the signage conditions re in that letter and the pa reference the page number, I think we can get that and put it into the, the record. So as you uh, make... They got a whole lot of stuff in the letter. Can we just accept the letter? I mean, you know, it's... I mean, I think if, if the commission... Straight combing and all this other stuff. Right. Um, so... I think that's a good point. So the, they actually had offered to put conditions related to traffic calming in the conditions that we were approving. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, I think we, we heard the financial commitment here already. Um, I, I asked that it be put in a letter instead. Um, and so I think that it would make sense to reference the letter, but I'd wanna make sure that we sort of agreed with um, GBT the, the GBT letter uh, requirements. And so I think just really quickly, um, <coughs> No, that's okay. It is a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think specifically we would want to reference the GBT letter from September 26th. September 27th. Related, September 27th, excuse me, related to um, signage requirements and the traffic calming uh, or traffic mitigation measures. <laughs> Um, study. and study. Okay, now I see September 26th. Where is September 27th? I, I know, there's two, it's the third. There's a, there's a few different oh, documents okay. in there. I got you. Okay. okay. So if you look, um, you'll see five um, different points. One is building materials, which we've already addressed um, in the staff report, street calming, traffic management, extensive landscaping, and signage and illumination. Staff, do you have any concerns with these five conditions or the five things that folks are agreeing to? Do you want to put the 75,000? Well, I, I, I'm comfortable referring to the letter. I didn't want to put that in as a condition. 
um, of the of I didn't want to identify the number two as a specific condition that we were re requesting. So just the subjects as identif as um, better described in the GPT letter. I'm yes. Asking. Yes. So I think I would say um, in your in your motion that the uh, letter from the applicant dated September the 27th, 2018, and adopting the five. Um, conditions as agreed to by the applicant. And um, is the uh, Greenway part of that? Is that already part of it? Did we already get that one? I, I believe that the applicant indicated that's already a part Can of the Can we ask the, the applicant to speak to the Greenway? Sure, there is uh, language in the um, cover letter talking about the greenways, mm -hmm. and um, we're happy to have a condition there as well. We're, we're happy to continue to work with the uh, city, to work with the Parks Department, to work with uh, Greenways Nashville, and to work with the community to talk about uh, greenway commitments that we can do, such as adding to the tree canopy and um, providing curbing along the greenways there to prevent parking. Is that on the September 27th cover letter? Or the that, that's in the initial cover letter, 26, I believe. 26, okay. You see it there? Okay. That's in the Waller letter. Oh, the Waller letter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right there. Okay. Gotcha. Can you give us one moment? We're just talking about one of the conditions with legal. While you're talking, um, Councilman Kendall, is this uh, is there anything else for this that you're comfortable with? I mean, um, still, this is your bill that you'll be carrying forward. Yeah, uh, I think you all have raised the uh, important issues that were brought to you about, and I can assure you that uh, we're talking about the Greenway portion of it that we will continue to to meet and work on that. Okay. Well, I'm going to shoot it out there. You guys can always um, shoot it back. Okay. <laughs> okay. I uh, make a motion to approve. Can I, can we? Have, I'm sorry. One more. No. Good. You're good. Um, actually, I'm go ahead. If you would mind, go I'm ahead and reading your motion, and then I'm going <laughs> to offer a suggestion to amend it. Um, but I think it'd be better to have it on the record first. So if you wouldn't mind going ahead and offering it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No one you're going to get amended before you get started. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. I make a make, make a motion to approve item 3A. One last thing. Can I do 3A and 3B at the same time? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, item number 3A um, uh, with staff conditions, also uh, the signage conditions and the traffic calming conditions that are outlined in the GPT letter of September 27th. Um, September 27th, and also um, the, uh, which are five items, and also on um, the waller Lenson item, part of the owner applicant of, uh, on three, which relates back to the greenways. So we have a motion. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, sorry, legal counsel and I are, are consulting. The, the question has to do with item number two, which is street calming, just so everyone knows what we're talking about. It says, we have committed $75,000 to fund traffic calming measures to, def to deter protective cut through traffic. We would like to leave that language as more general and essentially say um, we have committed, well, that we are requiring additional traffic calming study to prospective cut through traffic. And as this moves through the process and we have more detailed information, um, may I ask if the applicant is agreeing to that? Okay. So, which um, means it could go more. Is that true? It to could. Sure? Yes. And not, yeah. uh, we actually had a situation where we actually had somebody willing to do a study, but that was all. <coughs> There was no language about going past the study to do anything about it. So right. I'm, I worry so, about the implementation of what comes out of the study. So I think they're agreeing to implement, mm -hmm. but we have rules and laws that restrict us from um, uh, yeah, right, we need to be within the law here. And so it's great that they're agreeing, and I think they're agreeing to put that on the record. They want to fund, um, but I think that it, we can't um, go too far in, in requiring a certain amount. And so what I would suggest is 
if you wouldn't mind reading again, and you can say... Um, what? <laughs> <laughs> items one, three, four, and five. Can I just say the amended, we amend it to two? Oh, no? Yeah, you can amend it to, yes, okay, okay that's good. Okay. All, right, All right, thank you. Okay. Um, amended to include street calming, to study and fund uh, traffic calming measures to defer prospective cut through traffic. Okay, let's give it a go. Um, I'd like to make an amendment to that, of uh, the street calming um, condition that they put to make it more general to have a study that will be take off the limitation of the 75,000 that they put in their letter. Not quite. Amendment to study and fund the traffic calming measures that would deter prospective cut through traffic. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Let, let's let that record show that that's the amended language. Okay. <laughs> okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, I'm opposed. <laughs> Motion carries. Um, did I hear we take a break? Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break and we will reconvene. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. Good catch. Uh, we also need to do item 3B. Yeah. I make a motion that we uh, approve 3B to cancel the residence in my Marriott HUD. Do we have any other discussion? All in favor? I'm going to. I uh, support that one, too. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. All right, we'll get back to work. Uh, we're on item number nine. Lisa, is that going to be you? It is. All right, perfect. Um, item number nine is a uh, proposed text amendment. Uh, and this would, is, would amend the uh, permitted uses uh, section of the code. And the, permit, the proposed amendment would add a new condition requiring a separation between auto-related uses, including auto, automobile repair and automobile sales. Staff recommendation is to disapprove the text amendment. Um, the proposed text, it's a bit wordy here, but essentially it adds a requirement that no new automobile repair establishment shall be located less than uh, 1,320 linear feet from the property line of another auto repair, auto sales used, or auto services establishment. It does the same thing for automobile sales used. Um, it adds a distance requirement of 1,320 feet. Uh, just a bit of history about automobile sales and the way that they have been handled in the zoning code. In 2013, there was a bill that added certain design standards to automobile-related uses. It included separations between the parking area and the right-of-way, driveway consolidation, the location of fences such as um, uh, chain link fences, um, service door location and orientation, vehicle storage, and signage standards. Later in 2013, after that was passed by council, there was an additional bill that was introduced that would have modified the standards that were adopted earlier and would have added a separation requirement. Planning staff, staff had concerns at that time, particularly with the separation requirement. The Planning Commission recommended disapproval of the bill and it was ultimately withdrawn at council. In regards to the analysis of why staff is recommending disapproval of this separation requirement, there are several um, kind of several reasons why we're recommending disapproval. The first is in regards to enforcement difficulty. Anytime you're putting a separation requirement onto a specific use, there is a difficulty in enforcement at the codes level in regards to someone coming in for a permit and ensuring that you're making sure that you've gotten all of those like uses within that certain radius. Um, and so you usually have to re rely a lot on um, affidavits from the business owners. Um, and so it's really a difficult to enforce in regards to making sure that you have those separations. 
Uh, the second thing is that it may prohibit auto-related uses where they are appropriate, such as along corridors, uh, or along arterial corridors where you have the street capacity to be able to handle the traffic that's generated from those automobile-related uses. Third, existing uses could become entrenched in the neighborhood because it makes it harder for them to relocate to another more appropriate location. Fourth, it could create non-conforming use situations where if you have two, say, used auto lots right next door to each other, both of those would become non-conforming because they would not meet the separation requirement. Once a use is a non-conforming use, it has very extensive protections, including through Tennessee Code Annotated. So given that multitude of reasons, staff is recommending disapproval. Thank you, Lisa. We'll open this item for public hearing. The applicant would have 10 minutes, or, uh, but it's the, this, in this particular case, it's the council member, that, and he is not here. So is there anyone wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to oppose? All right. Uh, seeing none, no one else wishing to speak, we'll close the public hearing, and then who wants to go? It's, we don't have to, I mean, we can um, defer it, we can make a, mo you can make a motion, but generally we like to at least get, you know, some comments or discussion. Um, we could, generally. So, Vice Chair, would you like to open the discussion, or? Well, I think I think we either defer it and wait for the councilman, or um, I'm comfortable with staff recommendation. <coughs> Director. So, um, I reached out to the councilman um, before the meeting and asked whether or not there were any opportunities for us to come together and reach agreement, if he felt that he had had an opportunity to discuss his goals with staff, extent, you know, enough, and, um, you know, because we don't like to take a disapproval of a text amendment, you know, proposed by um, a council member unless we've exhausted all options. And he, you know, basically said that, you know, he, this is, it's not that he said it was symbolic, but he felt that it's important for the future of his district to remove some of these uses, and he felt like that's, this is an important step towards that. He understood that staff had concerns and didn't really disagree with them. I asked him if he wanted to defer, so for more discussion, and he, he said no um, when I spoke with him. So I might recommend, given that discussion, that we you know, ask questions and discuss staff's recommendation, but it was not his preference to, I don't think more time would get us anywhere. Well, I am comfortable with staff recommendation, but I will listen to others. Well, let's try this. Does anybody else have any comments instead of going to each person? Any commissioners? Any discussion? All right, we'll need a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve staff's recommendation for disapproval. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the item nine is disapproved. We are on to item 11. All right, item 11 is also a request to amend the text of the zoning code, specifically section 17.40.160, um, which is a section of the code that pertains to the uses permitted in neighborhood landmark districts. Um, this amendment would take this section of the code and replace it um, with new text, and the underlined portions are the parts that would be changed. So currently, um, uses are determined by the Planning Commission, and this would change it to Metropolitan County with a recommendation from the Planning Commission. Um, a little background for the, for the commission to explain um, where this is coming from. The Neighborhood Landmark District is an existing zoning overlay tool in the code. Um, it is intended to preserve and protect neighborhood features that are important to maintain and enhance neighborhood character. Um, and the primary purpose of the tool is to permit adaptive reuse. So the section of the code that's being amended is not, um, it doesn't pertain to the definition of a neighborhood landmark um, or its purpose. All of that is in a different chapter of the code and it's not changing with this amendment. 
It's actually also not changing the range of uses that could be permitted within a neighborhood landmark district. This is purely a procedural amendment um, to alter the decision-making authority on those permitted uses. Um, so as a little background, um, the neighborhood landmark process in the current zoning code involves two steps. The first is establishment of the overlay district, um, which is a change to the zoning map. And that is a step that recognizes the significance of the feature to the neighborhood character. Um, and that requires Metro Council approval currently. So it gets a recommendation from the Planning Commission and then the council makes the final decision. And then the second step is submittal of a neighborhood landmark development plan. Um, and that is a final site plan for the property that includes um, proposed uses, as well as any changes to the, the physical site, um, whether it be improvements to the structure, parking, landscaping, those types of issues. And under the current version of the code, the final decision on that development plan, including the uses within it, is made by the Planning Commission at a public hearing. That, that step does not go on to council. Um, there have been times where these have run concurrently, and so the Planning Commission has considered establishment of a district at the same time that you have the plan, um, but most often they actually run in sequence. So uh, there will be a proposal to establish a district, and then later um, the owner of that property will submit a development plan for the Planning Commission's consideration. So the amendment, um, which would change the, the, the decision-making process, would say that the uses um, included in that, in that development plan actually need council approval. Um, so it's a very narrow change to just who makes the decision on the uses. Um, and that would generally be appropriate because it ensures consistency in the zoning code. In our other um, zones and in zoning decisions, Metro Council is determining the uses. Um, so staff is, is considering that that's an appropriate change. However, um, when you put the, the um, onus on council to make the decision on use, this body is still charged with making a recommendation to council about whether the use is compatible with and sensitive to the neighborhood and appropriate to protect and preserve the important feature. Um, and so right now, the two-step process, um, you get most of the information about the use and the different aspects of the site that may or may not make that use compatible with the development plan. And so in order for the Planning Commission to have adequate information um, to make a recommendation to council, um, staff is recommending a substitute that actually consolidates this process. Um, so it would turn the whole thing into one step in which you propose the boundary of the district and you submit a development plan that outlines the uses. Um, all at the same time, the Planning Commission makes their recommendation with all of that information and then council would make the final determination. Um, and that has some advantages for the public as well because all of the information is available at the first step of the process um, and council's getting to vet out um, the use at the same time that they're discussing the significance of the feature. So it makes it a more holistic process um, in terms of the, the public input also. Um, so the key elements of the substitute that staff is proposing um, is consolidation of the establishment of the district and the development plan into a single review. Um, there are some standards that needed to be added to address, address the neighborhood landmark districts that already exist and have already been approved. And then um, once those changes were um, contemplated, there were some housekeeping changes needed as well um, to make sure that council retains authority over the use at every step um, and that the role of the Planning Commission and Council are very clear. And then once we consolidated those um, two pieces of the process, there were some standards that were actually duplicated. Um, so staff is re recommending cleaning that up as well. Um, to speak in a little more detail about the existing districts, um, if a district was approved under the um, current version of the code, um, there are some neighborhood landmark districts out there that have been established on the zoning map but do not yet have a development plan. So when those development plans come in, um, they would actually follow this new process, and under the new process, that would be considered an amendment to the Neighborhood Landmark District. The Planning Commission would hear the development plan, um, but it would just be a recommendation to Council, um, and they would make the final decision. 
There are some existing neighborhood landmark districts in which the Planning Commission has already approved a development plan. And if your development plan is approved, you would continue on under that plan until such time as you might want to change it. Um, but it would just be an existing approved district. Um, if there were a proposal to change the use um, to something that wasn't a listed use in a development plan or to add a new use that hadn't previously been contemplated, that would now also be an amendment and have to go to council. So council would pick up um, anything that alters the uses that were previously approved um, in the process. So as the proposal with the substitute recommended by staff um, would ensure consistency in the zoning code in terms of how uses are approved and determined um, and would simplify and consolidate the process um, throughout, staff is recommending approval with a substitute. Thank you. So we'll open this item for public hearing and same as in the last case that the council member is requesting it. He is not here. So we'll have to um, waive that part. And so is there anyone here wishing to speak in support? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. You. you know the drill. Two minutes and state your name and address. I know the drill. Welcome. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Cooper, 3409 Trimble. Uh, today I am speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Nashville Neighborhoods. While the Neighborhood Landmark District Overlay has been available for many years, it's now become a mechanism for spot zoning. The spirit of the NLD ordinance is to protect neighborhood landmarks from demise, not to circumvent the base zoning. However, recent examples demonstrate the opposite. This amendment still allows the land use to be changed and is bound to continue unless the ordinance is amended to prevent this from occurring. We believe subsection C of the substitute 174160 should be removed in its entirety, allowing prohibited uses of the underlying zoning district is basically a loophole for spot zoning. Rarely would the prohibited use be compatible with, sensitive to, or appropriate to the abutting properties and the overall neighborhood fabric. The point being, NLD is now a tool for developers, not a tool for preserving neighborhoods. Under the guise of NLD overlay, in August of this year, approval was given to a property zoned RS in a strictly residential neighborhood in Inglewood for the purpose of allowing a multimedia production venue and a detached accessory dwelling unit. Another recent approval was for a boutique hotel on property zoned R in historic Edgefield. It is unlikely either of these residentially zoned properties would have been rezoned for commercial uses under normal rezoning procedures. Both the previous planning commissions and Metro councils have disapproved these types of rezoning in the past. We urge you to request that section E of the current 174160 or C of the substitute be removed in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Freeman. I'm sorry. Am I okay? I'm Rebecca Freeman. I live at 1304 McChesney Avenue. I'm a member of the coalition also, but I have also came from the neighborhood where you approved Ivy Hall a couple of months ago. I'm here to address a couple of things. First, I have to recognize the staff has put a lot of work into this substitute um, bill, but I have some concerns. First, I want to say the definition of a neighborhood landmark overlay um, says the purpose is to prevent demolition and destruction of, they use various terms, but a feature or prudent, a pertinence, I can't say the word, or a property whose character would result in an irreparable loss to the community. And the first question you've got to answer when you're looking at uh, whether you approve a neighborhood landmark o overlay is whether there's a, a likelihood of any demolition or destruction or deterioration of a property. If it doesn't meet that criteria, it shouldn't be considered for an overlay. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that um, if my research is correct, the overlay process was created in 2000. And 
whatever the current use of an existing property is that's being considered for a neighborhood landmark overlay, the end result is it's going to be a commercial use because the the ordinance ostensibly is created to assure the preservation of the property uh, by some commercial means. Now that's spot zoning and each for each one of these and the question is are you ready to take that step on each one of them? Now I appreciate the staff's suggestion that some of these changes would streamline the process but you've got to be careful here because just the last one that was considered it was rushed through. The the um, development, um, I guess I'm stopped. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none and no one else wishing to speak, we'll declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Sims, you wanna go first? Oh, no, I don't. No? All right, well, Commissioner Gobble. This is over my head. Uh, I'll wait into it a little bit. Um, not that I totally understand it all. I, so this was requested by Councilman Davis. Have we been communicating with Councilman Davis about the substitute? Yes, so um, the councilman made a very narrow um, proposal, which was basically just to replace the words planning commission with Metro Council and move planning commission to a line that says you would make a recommendation. He made that only in the section of this um, this tool that pertains to the uses that are permitted. And it wasn't to change what uses could be permitted, it was just um, to ensure that Metro Council would decide what the appropriate uses were. They would make the final decision. Um, we were in communication with him about that very narrow change um, and realized that we needed to make sure if that was the intent behind his proposal that each body had the tools it needed to make those decisions in an informed way. And the way that the process was currently structured um, was going to leave um, this commission likely without enough information to make the recommendation it's charged with making. So it's this proposal um, is not affecting the definition of um, the the purpose of this tool, it's not affecting the fact that this tool is a tool in the code. Um, this is a very narrow proposal at its heart. Um, it's that we needed to reorganize the administrative procedures pretty significantly um, to meet the councilman's intent. And he's, I believe, comfortable with the substitute. And just this might help yeah. by way of a bit of background. I believe he had the, the last landmark case before us. And so I think he got, <laughs> basically during that process, it came to our attention that there were some questions about why the commission was ultimately determining uses when typically that's a function of the legislative body. And so we consulted with our legal team and they said, yes, we would recommend that you go ahead and return that particular decision point. And so I think the, the poor councilman essentially got, we asked him to carry the change forward since he had the most recent landmark, if that makes sense. No, uh, it does make sense. The the other concern I've got is that if you've got this consolidated into one step versus two steps, sometimes those, I mean, I, I go back to when this concept came about, and it was to save mainly historic structures, and it worked in many areas. Uh, sometimes it's not necessarily appropriate, but it did work, but it's not always known early on where you're gonna go with this. In other words, certainly they change ownerships, they do other things. So how would that come into play? So this, this consolidation would put a bit more, it would put more of a burden on the owner um, up front to, to be, um, to have a plan for the site and what they intend to do with it, to, if they're not going to be the owner, um, to have identified that partner and, um, and, and have that laid out on the front end. Because the tool um, is intended to permit adaptive reuse, but in a way that is sensitive to the community, I think staff felt that perhaps that burden was appropriate, um, that if we're going to have these types of uses in neighborhood locations, then we need to be very clear about how that's going to work as we're considering whether that's appropriate to preserve the feature. And just since I think this is a little bit 
put heady stuff, just, just to put root it in an example. We had a case, and perhaps the staff would, could remind us of the street, um, where we had a church. Um, the church was situated in a single family residential neighborhood. It had been identified as a landmark maybe 10, 10 years ago because the community came together and said, we care about this historic feature. How can we save it? But through a number of proposals, whether because of financing businesses or because the community wouldn't support it, the, nothing ever happened. And so I think, you know, this year, sometime within this last year, the commission approved the boutique hotel in the structure, but I think, Sean, just to root this an example so we can, I think in this, in that instance, you wouldn't have a 10-year lapse, correct? You would have, part of the proposal originally would have been both that this matters to our community and also we're going to have a hotel here and then that we're proposing. Is that correct? Yeah, I think right. it would ensure that the same um, neighbors, the same community that's coming together to identify it as important to their neighborhood are the same folks that are weighing in on on the use and, and how that site will continue to fit in the neighborhood in, as a neighborhood landmark. And we felt that that would be more advantageous to community yes. groups who felt that the community 10 years ago had determined something was valuable and we wanted, and, and people People are visual. It's helpful to know not just that something matters, but what's actually going to be done there. But I, I, I'm struggling with that part of it because mm -hmm. I, I see the value of getting that landmark classification and getting some degree of protection for that structure, mm -hmm. even though it took 10 years to get the actual function. And if you didn't have that, mm -hmm. and then and uh, the one you're talking about had other other protection on it too. But if you didn't have that, that kind of uh, protection of those structures, and we're, you know, we're in a period of time in Nashville where everything's working very well, but we're not always have not always been in that that world, and where you really are trying to solve these issues about how do you get these buildings. Uh, that may be more isolated than the one you're talking about uh, with a degree of protection and give a degree of good faith and the fact that it took 10, 10 years still made it work. And, and so that's my concern. So I'm going to listen, but that's where I am. Commissioner Moore. So I did want to just um, clarify a bit to say that we have a couple of different tools that are both called landmarks. We have the neighborhood landmark, which is this one, which the primary purpose is to permit for adaptive reuse of a building, which does not necessarily have to be historic by definition. It can just be an important feature to a community. And then we have the historic landmark, which is the historic designation that has to be approved by the Metro Historic Zoning Commission. And that uh, provides a level of protection in regards to demolition of a building. Whereas a neighborhood landmark, while part of the development plan can be that the building is to, ma to be maintained and reused, and that's the purpose of it, um, it's not necessarily only for historic buildings. So I just thought that that might be a good distinguishing factor to make. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh yeah, Commissioner. Uh, so what would be an example of a neighborhood non-historic landmark? So there is a, I can think of one, there's a church in East Nashville that's on, I think, Rosebank. It's kind of right on the corner, which it's an interesting building, but it's not necessarily in significantly important in regards to its architecture or the time period. But the neighborhood, because of its location, felt that it was important enough to put a neighborhood landmark so that it could be adaptively reused. Um, I'm thinking of there's a, another church. It tends to sometimes be um, institutional type buildings. There's another church in the nations that I think was built sometime in maybe the 70s and so it's a bit of an odd architecture but not necessarily historic and so it doesn't have to be historic capital H um, to be a neighborhood landmark it can just be of importance to the community so if we had one of those where we really struggled with that or have they all been historic 
Uh, well, generally what we have seen is that, no, not necessarily. Generally what we have seen is that a lot of the times the council members will also ask that they get historic landmark if it is historic capital H. But, you know, there's a, a, a kind of a corner location where a retail shop, and I think recently changed to a um, bicycle shop, and I don't think that one was actually designated as historic, but it was unique. But maybe to the commissioner's concern to clarify, if in the, because I think I'm hearing we prioritize unique structures and we want to make sure we have a process where they can be protected and where we um, take into account the, the sort of economics that will help make them productive, you know, help make them productive and useful buildings. Is that right? And so I think um, a question might be, if we, under this process, you go to council, you get the you, the designation and the use is approved, and for whatever reason the use has failed, and it takes 10 years to sort of get more uses, is there a process by which that can be accomplished? I'm wondering if that might help eliminate some of the concerns that you're raising. Well, even, even beyond that, if you've got a, for example, a historic structure mm -hmm. that they're willing to go and get a landmark status uh, as a way to protect it. But they, you know, they're not going to be the people who actually develop it. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that's going to say, all right, I'm going to facilitate that process by getting this done. And in return, I'm going to kind of give some assurity, some assurance that it's not going to be messed with mm -hmm. too much. And I remember when I was on the Historic Zone Commission, I saw this, where people would come in and get these, you know, a home or something, and saying, I'm trying to get this status. And, you know, and we were encouraging them to get a landmark status to help protect that property, but uh, this is just one of the incentives. And I guess, I'm, without really knowing what that identity is, I do well, I think a lot of times when we hear like you need a, a development plan or a final plan, we think of a lot of um, a lot of very particular details and engineering and the costs associated with with coming up with that. I think with a lot of the neighborhood landmarks, since they're preserving the structure, um, the development plans are actually relatively simple um, compared to the the types of engineered site plans that we look at with brand new development, and so. Um, it's, you would be, I think, you know, you're demonstrating that you have parking areas, you're demonstrating that you have landscaping, you're demonstrating that you're not going to shine a light in a particular direction. They're kind of higher level um, development questions. And so I think it would be possible for the, an owner of a property or a neighborhood to identify um, uses that could be accommodated in an existing structure within the bounds of what that structure can contain um, without having to do a lot of detailed site planning. Um, and so it might be that, that they could submit a development plan that gave more than enough information for this commission to find to make the findings that you're charged with making um, without actually, it, they could even permit more than one use potentially um, if that was something that, that the community was comfortable with and that the council were to approve. So I think there are ways that, that it could still be used in the way that you're describing where you don't have a full concrete idea idea of how you're going to renovate um, that would still get the protection in place. Commissioner, you good? I'm, I'm still, we'll listening. Keep, still listening. Still <laughs> listening. Complicated issue. Mm -hmm. Commissioner? <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen some more. <laughs> Vice Chair? So I have some more questions, and Commissioner Gobble, thank you. You kind of got me thinking about this. Um, so I think, it's, thinking about the last two that I can remember us seeing, um, they haven't been driven by the community. They've been driven by private interests. And so in that sense, I understand they should come to us with a development plan because they know, I mean, from the outset, they're, that it's pretty clear how they're going to redevelop that property or what they want to do with that property. But the examples you're giving, you know, and kind of the way we would hope that this could be used would be if the neighborhood comes together and says, we really believe this is a structure worth preserving for the neighborhood. We want to see this go forward. But they're not going to have the capacity or necessarily even the resources at this point to put together a development plan. And I think... Um, 
I mean, so I really do. I'm, I'm really struggling with this one because I see it both ways. Like, I would have been much happier with, with the two that we've seen recently had they been together because it would have made me much more comfortable approving it. Um, but the flip side to what you're describing, I'm realizing that's not always going to be feasible. And if it's a tool we want to make available to communities to come together and pick the, name, the buildings they preserve, I'm less inclined to put the additional burden on them. So I don't know how to marry those two. I'll, um, I'll remind the commission, it's still a, a rezoning that the property owner has to initiate or a council member. But um, really, it's not a... It's not a historic landmark. It's a, a neighborhood landmark. Even though the word neighborhood's in there, it's, it, it, it's something that is meant to allow additional uses to help fund preserving that structure. And um, it's not generally something that's uh, initiated by a neighborhood group. It's by the property owner who wants to do something else with that property in order to preserve the, the structure. Okay. So, and also, I guess another question, I mean, we have seen one that came in and was approved, and then we approved the development plan, and then a couple of years later, we approved a new development plan. So how would this work going forward if we approved the landmark and the plan, and then that didn't come to fruition, and they came back in with another development plan? <coughs> So um, there are, in the, in the proposed substitute by staff, there are some different categories. Um, what would constitute an amendment and require council to, to concur again um, versus what might constitute a revision um, or a minor modification. So if there were um, a change that, um, let's say the original development plan permitted a particular use and then there were some parking spaces and landscaping. If there needed to be modifications to uh, parking spaces or landscaping, that could happen at the commission or staff level depending on the extent. Um, if there were a change in use, then that would have to go back to council. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that use is a, is a category. So if a landmark development plan permitted, permitted retail, there could be different retail, different things that qualify as retail could go into that space without council having to be involved again. But if, it, if the proposal was to change the neighborhood landmark development plan from a retail use to an office use, let's say, um, then that actually would require council to concur with that, unless the original development plan listed either, listed both as possibilities. But Does they would still, it would maintain the neighborhood landmark status mm -hmm. even if the development plan, so that wouldn't be that different from how we see it today. Exactly. So the, the, um, what you can do under the neighborhood landmark status is a function of the development plan piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, but the neighborhood landmark itself, once it's there, you can only do what's in the development plan. And so if, if the um, owner, if it transferred ownership and they wanted to do something else with it, that, that neighborhood landmark designation results in there being review of the changes to the development plan. And that designation is still a zoning overlay on the map unless there were proposal to actually cancel the district. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the two folks that spoke from the community had some good points um, as well. And I mean, I know, you know, that seemed to me a little, I, I, I don't know that we're looking at this, at all of the sections, right? We're only looking at the certain areas that have been proposed for amendments. So that, I mean, with the, the items that they brought up in item C would require a right. different amendment? Right. I think we were trying to get within, address the guidance that we had received from legal that we needed to return the, the decision about use to council. Okay. And so that's fundamentally what our goal was. So no, we weren't we weren't assessing the, the question of permitted land uses, but I would say that if the proposition is that we are trying to protect a building feature or pertinence that a community has come together and said, if this goes away, it will cause irrevocable harm. I forget what the exact language is, but this is so important. Then I think that in the estimation of the, the, the premise of this is basically that there is a business aspect to that. Um, and so that is partly what comes into play when we're assessing whether or not it's appropriate 
to put it to approve a use in a building that is different from the zoning yeah. because as as commissioner gobble pointed out that's very often you know a that may be a commercial use or that may be something that will make the building function again mm -hmm. and and very often because they're in neighborhoods that is different than what's allowed in the zoning so that is actually what what is it, that piece of it number c i would say is is a probably a foundational element of what a landmark is right right um it's not true Treated as um, a zone, a, a, t a typical zone district. If yeah, I was going to say, absent the ability, the whole purpose of this is to allow for adaptive reuse. Right, right. Where a an absent that provision to allow uses other than those by the base zoning, there's not really a purpose for. No, and I think market. I feel like you know when, when I've seen these to date, we've really have focused on the compatibility of the use. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like we'll just take any any non-permitted use and allow that to go forward. I mean, I know there was some debate about Ivy Hall, but um, you know, general. I know we debate each one individually. So I think that's I, I'm not opposed. Um, I think there's, but I I do think there's something here with you know, the timing issue um, and really reconciling how that becomes a community, if it's a community-led initiative versus... Well, I think, uh, so how about this? I know this is a, a complex issue and I think it seems like we're making um, progress on it for sure, but there are some, some questions inside. So talk to the director. What, what is... What is the timing and the process on the on the council side? If we potentially deferred it for a couple of meetings and sure. kind, of, kind of thought about it some more with staff. Sure. So there is a bill that has been introduced and it is set for public hearing on Tuesday, mm. October second. Public hearing, public second hearing. reading. So they'll need a recommendation from the Planning Commission before it can go forward to the public hearing. Before Unless Tuesday? The, I'm sorry? Before Tuesday? Tuesday? Yes. Are there some opportunities? I mean, Lisa, if we wanted to, are there some opportunities if we wanted to address the, some of the questions that, commission, that the commissioners ask about the, the timing piece, whether or not it will have a chilling effect, I think, is, is partly what I'm hearing. Is that on? Sure. sure. So, I mean, uh, zoning bills can be amended up to third reading. I mm -hmm. would say that the, the one of the primary reasons that when Sean and I were looking at this in regards to how to best achieve the goals of having Count, having the recommendation be made to the council from the Planning Commission was that the Planning Commission is charged with determining whether the uses are compatible and appropriate and absent having the development plan, we weren't sure how you could achieve that part of your mission with that first step of recommending the development plan or the and development. And even, even though the ordinance today doesn't require the, the uses to be spelled out in the first step, there's very few of these that have gone through the process where they didn't have to meet with the community and explain what uses they were going to do. So this, this I don't really see it as that much different than what's already been happening on 95% of these, is that they've had to put plans together and they've had to show the community what they plan to do in order to get the initial step through council. And then they would come back to the Planning Commission for the development plan, but in the vast majority of these cases, they've already shown those plans plans up front to the community. So I, I don't really think it's changing the practice of what's what's been done in the past. I think this is uh, just changing it on, on, in the zoning code. Commissioner Gobble. Uh, and I'm comfortable with the, that concept. <clears throat> it's just that I would like to have some option mm -hmm. to have a two-step process if it were if if it were deemed advisable. And I mean, I, I certainly hear what you're saying. I totally agree with it. Uh, it's just that I have seen times where things like this, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we've lost more buildings and more significant pieces of property in Nashville through neglect. <clears throat> then we really have to aggressive demolition. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So, you know, I just wanted to have a provision that where if the community felt something was strong enough that it could be, should be preserved, even though they may not have all the, all the solutions or the resources to, to do those things, they could do that. Um, but, you know, I don't know if it'd be appropriate, but I'm a, I'm a favor of moving for s approval uh, <clears throat> with the substitute, provided that the council continue to work, I mean, the staff work with council on the options of trying to modify that slightly to, to handle that as an option or just consider it. I mean, you guys are m more knowledgeable than I am, so. Good. Yes, I, I think that, I think we'll, we can definitely do that. Well, did we, when we were, I mean, did, was there thought given to just council approves the development, the landmark overlay and council approves the development plan, but they don't have to happen simultaneously? I mean, I think it helps a lot, but, uh, but I mean, to your point, that's how we are currently doing, I mean, that's how it's working right now when we're making a decision about whether or not we want to preserve a landmark. And, and referring that to council. I mean, but then we, we're we debated a lot of different options when we looked at this, the substitute, and I mean, we debated whether the council could just approve the use but not the development plan, and that could come back to the commission, but it seemed like it would be difficult for us to approve a use and for you as a commission to approve a use, not knowing if they can park that adequately. And I mean, we don't want to approve uses that are then gonna require the whole front yard to be covered in a parking lot. So we kind of need to see that development plan to see if that if the use fits into the neighborhood and so in our mind they, they kind of go hand in hand once you pick the once you have a use then you need the development plan and that's why we recommended that it be one step that goes to the, the council and like I said most people are putting those plans together up front anyway in order to get through the community meetings and to meet with the community and show them what they plan to do and show how that it's not going to impact the neighborhoods. So maybe I'm confused. So when you put in place a neighborhood landmark district today, you have to identify the use? No. So we couldn't leave the process as it is now where we approve the neighborhood landmark district and then they come back in with a development plan. I mean, where we, approve, where we make a recommendation to council and it's approved. And then they come back in with a development plan, which identifies the use, and we make a recommendation to council and that gets approved. So we leave it the two steps. So I would say that what we have found it is it has become increasingly difficult to get a neighborhood develop a neighborhood landmark through the process without the use being established on the front end. Okay. Because there is a neighborhood desire to understand what the use is going to be and what the implication is. Okay. So with the Ivy Hall, which you all saw, I think is the most recent one, that came through together as right. the establishment of the district and the development plan, those were both done, and it actually, I think that they amended the bill at council to establish the yeah. use. Neighborhoods don't generally want to write a blank check and say, right. we'll, we'll trust, because it could change ownership, and they could say that whoever is in front of them one day, it, it could change, and they could come back and with a, with a different well, use. It's not a, a blank plan. check when it, when, if it has a neighborhood landmark district, neighborhood landmark overlay on it. That's not the blank check. Right. The blank check is the the, the development plan. The development plan, right. So we didn't want to recommend a use without seeing that plan. No, that makes sense. I'm, I'm all so in favor what, of that. That's what we're doing in this proposal is tying them together. But you're not, <clears throat> but you're not recommending that if it, so you're saying that you don't want to recommend the landmark designation without knowing the development plan, right? I think it would be helpful for y'all to clarify that today council is responsible for kind of giving the honorary designation and that does not have to come with uses or a development plan. So there is an honorary thing that says this matters, this building or structure matters. It's the issue I think has come when the uses are proposed absent a development plan. And so I guess when, if, if I'm hearing, is the question whether or not there is value in having an honorary designation only. There are some circumstances where you might have that and not have uses established, not have a development plan where, is that what I'm hearing you ask? Okay, so we think that this church 
is a neighborhood landmark. I don't think there's any value to that. Okay. Because, I mean, if it's a architecturally significant and someone wants to designate, they can put a historic landmark on it, not a neighborhood landmark. The neighborhood landmark's sole purpose is to allow uses that wouldn't be allowed otherwise in order to help preserve that. Okay. Well, Does that answer your... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, that makes me feel a little better. I mean, I still, still a little confused by it, but that's not the first time. It's not even the first time this week. Or tonight. Or tonight. <laughs> All right, so we'll need a, a motion. Well, there's three commissioners that may still have thoughts oh. now. <laughs> Two of us have just been talking a lot. Yeah. No. It, um, any other commissioners have comments or discussion? I just have a question. Commissioner Sims. What happens in neighborhoods that don't, are sitting on something that's important, but they don't know what to do with it? And that's to your question. Or, you know, we have a lot of particularly that I'm, I'm attentive to the urban core, where there are some houses like the Emerson House that got torn down, which was, you know, the first African-American sculpture in the country. The, the neighborhood recognized its importance, but didn't know what to do about it. So this is, as stated before, so generally with any kind of rezoning, and this is ultimately a rezoning, yeah. an application to rezone is made by the property owner. Um, or a council member. Um, and the council member ones that we see are generally for large area, right. essentially down zonings. And so um, this wouldn't be a tool where a neighborhood would say, we're going to apply to rezone that property because we do have to have the owner's consent essentially on an application to rezone. And so this is a tool that has been used by property owners to uh, adaptively re reuse structures that are important to the neighborhood and generally the neighborhood is involved in that public process to say yes we agree this is important and should be kept not necessarily for historic reasons but for something that is special to our neighborhood it should be kept and therefore we agree with the application of the overlay and so they kind of get involved in that public process I haven't seen many where the council members haven't had part of the public process, but it is. And we've had a few neighborhood landmark applications where the, the public came out and said, it's not important enough to us to, to put it, that building's been changed so many times that it's no longer got the, the significance that it once did, and it's not worth, a, worth it to us to put extra uses in there in order to preserve this building. And we've had that happen a few times where it got here in the, at the public hearing and it was rejected because the neighbors didn't want extra uses at that cost, at, at, and because the structures had changed. Any, any other discussion? We'll make sure we get it all out. <laughs> all right, seeing none, we'll need some type of motion. I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation and appreciate the, all the additional clarity <laughs> that you've provided. It's a proper motion. Is there a second? I'll say that. Second. <laughs> Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. All right. We are on <laughs> item 21. The next item on the agenda is item 21. This is a request to rezone property from AR2A to CS zoning. Staff recommendation is to disapprove. The six acre site is located at 1488 and 1492 Bell Road, approximately 4,600 feet west of the intersection of Bell Road and Blue Hole Road in the Southeast Community Plan area. Site conditions include two parcels, each with a single family house. Surrounding land uses consist of single family residential with some two family residential and large vacant parcels immediately adjacent to the site. 
The site is located in the Agricultural Residential AR2A Zoning District. Nearby zoning districts include the Agricultural AR2A Zoning District and a SP Zoning District for residential uses. The site is located near the center of a large area currently zoned AR2A. The site is located in the Conservation and T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy Areas. Conservation policy is intended to preserve environmentally sensitive land features through protection and remediation. T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy is intended primarily for residential uses and also to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with more housing choices, improved pedestrian, bicycle, and vehicular connectivity, and moderate density development patterns. The proposed commercial service zoning is not consistent with the T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving Policy Area as it could introduce commercial uses into a policy area that is intended primarily for residential neighborhoods, given the aforementioned staff recommendation is to disapprove. Thank you. And we'll open this item up for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. Welcome. Give us your name and address. You'll have 10 minutes. You can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Welcome. Hi, my name's John Fox, uh, 1015 Cumberland Ridge Way. I represent the applicant, Williams Properties. Um, I think um, the interesting thing to talk about, um, obviously Mr. Burst explained why the planning staff's recommendation is for disapproval. I think with Councilman Bindi not being here and this being his district, uh, I think everyone received a letter that long term he is trying to get the community plan amended for this area to bring about more commercial uses. So I think we are just a little ahead of the game when it comes to that. Um, and we have worked this process with the councilman by having a neighborhood meeting that was advertised on Facebook. We sent letters out um, and had a frank discussion with the community members and they were very supportive. Um, councilman Bendy also requested that we maybe create some sort of business incubator at the front of the facility that would allow for small offices for people that are starting businesses to be able to rent something uh, month to month or have a use for that. Then combined with the self-storage facility, we're gonna build in the back. And a self-storage facility, you know, is a commercial use, but if you're gonna have a commercial use, it's about the best one for density issues because the traffic through facility, if we have 20 cars in there a day using the storage facility, that's a lot. Um, you know, other than that, I, I'll save the, my other two minutes unless someone has some questions they would like to ask me. Thank you. And we'll save uh, two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone here in the audience wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'm sure you'll waive your rebuttal. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner. Um, you want to go first? Curious if the staff is is um, thinking about amending the Southeast Community Plan. Is that on the table or? <laughs> He's hiding. From behind the post. Um, uh, Lisa and I did speak with the council member about this request to look at uh, the corridor um, for a community plan amendment. We haven't uh, gotten that into our work program at this time, but we're going to talk with the council member about his goals for that project and look at uh, where it might fall in our work program over the next year. Is that been sparked specifically by the council member? Has there been anything? within the staff that has shown a need to, to amend that? No, not, not that I know of. I haven't been made aware of anything along Bell Road in this location. Thank you. Vice Chair? Can you show, do we have an aerial that shows a little bit more of the area? Okay. So we're quite some distance from it. Like, uh, that's a commercial property up the up the street to the on the right hand side. Is that a more commercial? 
so so you have multifamily residential where the cursor is located on the screen. If you continue to go further east, you'll get to Blue Hole, the intersection of Bell Road and Blue Hole mm -hmm. Road. Uh, there's a existing multifamily residential PUD where the cursor is located um, for additional apartments. And then you get to some commercial uses as you go to the west toward Old Hickory Boulevard, where Old Hickory Boulevard converts into Bell Road over here where the cursor is located. Show policy. Oh, yeah. So, and I, I want to point out there is a already a neighborhood center that is part of an SP that was previously approved. So, as part of the policy, there is some commercial plan for this area, but having the entire corridor go to commercial wasn't really in, in the plan at this point. So, I mean, I, I appreciate the councilman's letter that that was helpful. Um, but looking at the existing character of that area and seeing how much residential there is, I think that I would be more comfortable waiting to approve this kind of zoning change until I see more about what's happening up and down Bell Road there. Commissioner Sims? Um, I'm a little concerned simply because Councilman Binet is with us. He's one of us and he, in his letter expressed a real desire to see us do this. So I think I would be more comfortable waiting to have some kind of conversation face to face with our fellow commissioner and the, and the council person that's putting this forth. So. I agree. I'd be more comfortable to commissioner. <laughs> So what, what would that require? Are we, is there a, is there a problem <laughs> deferring right, that? Where, where are we on the process of deferral? I mean, if we were to defer. No bill has been submitted. Okay. So, we so what would be? Two meetings. You want to do two meetings? Well, if we're going to defer, can we, Reason. I mean, can we give you guys a little bit of time just to give us a really high level yeah. thinking on I mean, we're a little stuck because the policy, which this commission is really need, should rely on to approve zone changes, does not support commercial. I mean, it's right. a residential policy. Right. So it's a residential policy. So I think it would be very unusual for us to support a commercial proposal in a residential area. Exactly. So I think in some ways a deferral um, is punting a what a decision that would take longer than two meetings to get to because I think what you're really asking for is a is a policy review right and so um, but if, if really the issue is um, you want to have that dialogue with the, the council member here I think we could do that next meeting so you could do a one meeting deferral kind of have that dialogue but I don't think that the fundamental issue would be resolved just given that it's a residential policy sometimes there's discretion in the policy um, in this case it's we're a little stuck so so I, I think I would then recommend a one meeting deferral um, staff you disagree yep everybody's okay if that works Commissioner Moore, you want to make a motion for one? So I move for a one meeting deferral for this That's item. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. One meeting deferral. And we are on to. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Tibbs is not here for historic. Hain Commissioner Haynes is not here for parks. Executive committee report, we don't have anything, Vice Chair, do we? Or do you no, have No, do we have a, a date? Did you, I know we had a work schedule, a work session that we rescheduled. Any date on that? We do not yet have a date. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we're working on a, a we'll work another on. workshop. Okay. Yeah, we we're, we're having problems getting schedules. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. we'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> Kelly is going to work on that. <laughs> Me. All right. Perfect. <laughs> and the Vice Chair. And then, um, Director, do you have anything to report that you would like to update us on? No. Other than we're working on a, on a meeting. Okay. We're, we're working on a meeting. All right. And then Councilman's not here. So is there any other business? Saying none, we're adjourned. Thank you.
This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.